thank you, Sujit, for that uh, wonderful overview of uh, EICBI and the and outlining the 60 years of uh, the wonderful relationship between India and the European Union. Now, he is a member of European Parliament from Denmark, chairman of the European Union Delegation for Relations with India, and a strong supporter of Europe India Center for Business and Industries activities, none other than Mr. Soren Gade. I have great pleasure in inviting you, Mr. Soren Gade, to deliver your welcome address to the EU India 60 Summit. Over to Mr. Soren Gade. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and thank you very much for the very warm uh, welcome you just gave me. Now, I'm very honored to, uh, to speak to you all today. Thank you so much for inviting me on this uh, very special day to deliver a few opening remarks. As chair of the EU-India delegation on diplomatic relations, it is a great honor to stand before you all today. And today, as we have already heard, we celebrate the 60 years of anniversary of the partnership between India and the European Union. India got its first ambassador to the European Union, the European Union Honorable Christian Bahari Lal, 10 years before my home country, Denmark, was even a member of the Union. Now, that is something to both celebrate and to be proud of. But as we all know, there is still some work to do before our bilateral relations reach their fullest uh, and, the, uh, and the potential. Regarding the trade between the two parties, the European Union is only India's third largest trade partner, trailing behind China and the United States of America. And for EU, India is only the 10th largest trading partner, way behind many countries, including China. Now, the trade between our parties has indeed increased significantly during the past 10 years, but trade in general served still serve as an example of how the relationship between our two parties needs to be strengthened for the benefit of both the European Union and, of course, for India. Even though a bilateral agreement on free trade and investments uh, between uh, the parties can seem a bit far away today, I would like to stress the fact that the European Parliament, as we speak, is discussing a report that's focused on how we can actually strengthen these uh, economic ties. It clearly emphasizes the political will to increase the cooperation between our two parties to strengthen this relationship. That direction uh, was uh, also obvious during the European Indian Summit last year, and especially in the joint state statement produced at the end of the summit. I think it is essential to boost trade and investment between our two parties because it will increase the life quality for both Europeans and the population of India. Furthermore, an even closer cooperation will create a platform to exchange ideas, knowledge and technology that we can use in the fight against climate changes. But as I see it, more importantly, we need to strengthen our relationship because we now live in an obvious, more and more polar, polarized world with many powers challenging the, democ the, 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 democracy, the, the democracy and liberal uh, order um, that both the European Union and India are guardians of. Of course, the most recent and horrifying example is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We apparently live in a world where peaceful countries are invaded by non democratic states. The action seen in Ukraine can be the trigger in the direction of a much more polarized uh, world with uh, um, with uh, three countries on the on, on one side and non-democratic and aggressive countries on the other side. It is therefore also of utmost importance that states and organizations that share shares the same fundamental, uh, fundamental values, such as a belief in the rule of law, human rights, and democracy, intensify their cooperation. 
Indian and the European Union are therefore natural partners, as we indeed share these basic values and beliefs. Now the time is uh, to build on the foundation laid by Honorable Christian Bahai Lalan 60 years ago, and to continue the work towards a strong and deeper relationship relationship between the European Union and India built on mutual respect and shared values. I'm looking forward to work towards these goals from my position as the chair of the European India delegation at the European Parliament. I strongly believe that the 75 years anniversary for India's independence on the 15th of August offer a perfect occasion to attenuate these bonds of friendship. I personally personally look forward to visiting India to celebrate the anniversary and to strengthen the ties between our two great uh, democratic parties. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you so much for letting me address you today. I wish you all the best and all the best for the relationship between the European and India in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soren Gage, for touching upon various salient features and also looking forward to welcoming you to India during the 75th year of independence and 60 years of India-EU relations. Welcome. Thank you so much. Now, I have pleasure in inviting Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti, IFS, the Joint Secretary of Europe West Division, Ministry of External Affairs in India, to deliver his speech on the India-EU relations, the perspective for the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted uh, to, be, to be here today. And uh, today is a very uh, special day. Uh, I don't have a speech as such in the sense that uh, I will talk, uh, I'll, I'll deliver some remarks and I'll, I'll give my, you my perspective of, uh, of our relations with, uh, with the EU. And um, as, as I was mentioning, uh, today is a very special day. I think in 1962 on March 2nd, our ambassador presented his credentials. Uh, to the president of the EU Commission. At that time, it was the European Economic Community uh, on, on this day, so 60 years back. Uh, so today is the 60th anniversary in a way of uh, our relations with, uh, with the EU or its uh, uh, former uh, you know, uh, versions or whatever you may wish to call it. We were supposed to, uh, to do a small event and activity uh, along with the EU delegation today. Uh, but because of what is happening uh, in in Europe presently, uh, that event has has been has been postponed. Now I'm very happy to join this forum, and I understand uh, you are working actively in promoting ties uh, uh, with with uh, with the EU countries as well as with UK. So you have a broader uh, European perspective. So I, I really appreciate that and applaud uh, your your activities. Uh, what I would like to say is that. Uh, our ties with uh, let me focus on on the eu and not not uh, not mention uh, our ties with the uk which which uh, is again is a huge huge relationship and and, and has a lot of uh, potential uh, to 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 deliver uh, but let's focus on the eu uh, as you know eu has uh, several uh, member states 27 of them and we have uh, uh, very good relations with all of them and uh, particularly with with some of them so uh, always this play is there between our relations with, with the member states and, 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 and with the EU as an institution, because the member states have some competencies and EU has other competencies. So uh, for us uh, in India, uh, it is not always very easy to, to navigate uh, this, this. So that is one issue that we always face. Having said that, uh, the relationship with the member states and EU is actually incredibly um, you know, strong, uh, it's deep, it's based on, on values, uh, both are huge uh, democratic spaces, uh, you know, and, and uh, we, we, we think alike, we have similar aspirations, we, we, we work together uh, wonderfully in, in multilateral institutions. And, and uh, you know, I will mention a few, a few cases and I'll mention some examples from where you will see how uh, deeply and, and nicely India and, and the EU are, are engaged. We have something 
which is known as the strategic partnership it was uh, it was established in the 5th india eu summit at the hague uh, in 2004 and last year no not last year now 2020 we had the 15th summit so we've had so far uh, 15 summits at the level of our prime minister and uh, from the eu side it is their council president and the president of the commission and uh, very very uh, you know uniquely i must say and, and a very special occasion was the leaders meeting uh, in in porto last year on 8th may uh, when uh, prime minister modi met with the heads of all 27 eu countries so that was a very special moment and, and a very special occasion and i will mention to you later on Uh, what was achieved in, in that meeting but again it shows you know that we have a structure of uh, of a summit level meeting uh, at the level of the prime minister and, and the two eu presidents and then last year we or in 2021 we had the uh, leaders meeting at at porto it was supposed to be an in person meeting but unfortunately due to uh, due to the delta wave uh, of covid we couldn't uh, travel to to porto but Uh, but it was a unique and special occasion because uh, you know 27 leaders were in one room and 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 you know we found a lot of uh, support and and solidarity with with india about our developmental goals and and the way uh, we are uh, approaching our 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 uh, targets and objectives as far as 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 we go along now uh, what happened in this meeting there were two or three outcomes i will mention a few one was that the stalled india eu trade negotiations were 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 restarted it was decided the leaders decided to restart the trade negotiations and now that is very important so the trade negotiations would start um, uh, in 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 terms of having three earlier we used to have the btr uh, bilateral investment and trade agreement uh, btia uh, but uh, we now decided to have three separate agreements one is the trade agreement one is the investment agreement and the third one is a geographical indications uh, agreement so all three will uh, will uh, be parallelly uh, negotiations for all three will be parallelly undertaken and 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 we hope to to conclude all three uh, at the same time now uh, although the leaders decided in in uh, may of last year to restart the negotiations uh, we have not yet restarted the negotiations we are uh, at the moment uh, deciding on the terms of reference of the negotiations and uh, i would say that there has been some delay from the eu side in in formulating uh, the scoping paper and uh, they wrote to us in the end of last year and we have recently responded and i hope i sincerely hope that uh, they will nominate their uh, chief negotiator and we will start uh, the negotiations on the free trade agreement and other agreements that we decide was decided at the leaders meeting uh, very soon uh, now uh, after the leaders meeting and uh, last year and the 15th summit uh, in 2020 where are we going so we are working towards holding the next uh, india eu summit uh, uh, when i don't know uh, but uh, you know naturally it should happen uh, happen this year and uh, and uh, we are yet to finalize the dates for for that meeting apart from that uh, you know what are we what are we working on at at the moment with the eu Uh, we are working on on of course as i mentioned the trade and and uh, and the investment agreements we are working closely with the eu on clean energy <coughs> on on uh, and on environment on on clean energy and there's a huge program uh, of working uh, with the eu on 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 the, on this issue we are even looking at at uh, cooperation in in green green hydrogen in in terms of uh, research in terms of uh, you know electrolyzers uh, battery capacities etc so we are hoping that uh, in the, in the next summit we will be able to make some announcements as far as india eu uh, relations are concerned in 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 green hydrogen the eu as you know has also come out with its uh, indo pacific strategy in last year in, in august now that is again a reaffirmation of their interest and and role that they want to play in the indo pacific in our region Uh, the eu uh, in the past had been slightly diffident they were not uh, forthcoming but after some of the member states uh, particularly uh, france germany uh, netherlands came out with the indo pacific strategy uh, uh, the eu was also also came out with this indo pacific strategy now what does this indo pacific strategy mean i will i will explain uh, subsequently uh, here it is important to mention that 
at the leaders meeting apart from agreeing to uh, the tr trade negotiations we also came out with a connectivity partnership and india uh, eu connectivity partnership now the, the role of the connectivity partnership comes in here now because the eu uh, declared its indo pacific uh, strategy it also declared its global gateway on connectivity so these two merge in very nicely how will the eu increase its presence in in the indo pacific it will increase its pres presence in the indo pacific not only uh, militarily you know it will have more ships and more more presence in in in, in the ma marine uh, in the maritime sector that is fine but what else will it do it will it will implement the co connectivity partnership it will invest more in this region it will invest more in in transmission lines in in uh, railway lines in in roads in ports in 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 uh, increase in in digital connectivity in increasing people to people connectivity so there were seven eight pillars uh, in which uh, on which the connectivity partnership was based so with the indo pacific strategy and the global gateway uh, we are expecting greater presence of uh, eu uh, in the indo pacific region which extends from the eastern coast of the african continent to the uh, western uh, shores of the american uh, continent so this is the space uh, that is defined by indo pacific and uh, we want the eu to be present because we are uh, votaries of a multipolar world and and when you want a multipolar world where india is on the poles we need other powers also to play a role uh, in the indo pacific so in in uh, in in uh, broadly this is the strategic uh, framework uh, under which we are working uh, apart from that you know there are a large number of institutional frameworks lots of meetings lots of groups jwgs uh, are uh, present and they frequently meet in pushing the india eu ag agenda we have a very robust uh, scientific uh, snt cooperation under horizon europe uh, framework we have uh, an energy panel with the with the eu which decide, which has a work plan and, and and program of action where we work on renewable energy and 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 on improving the grid performance and um, we also have several uh, other security and defense related framework we 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 are now going to start um, uh, discussions with the eu on on defense and and security issues we have um, working groups on counter terrorism we have working groups on maritime security on non proliferation so as you can understand uh, it's a, it's a web of structures that are there which are which are active and 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 it creates the ties uh, that bind uh, india and the eu having said that uh, we have also very strong relations with the member state with france germany netherlands italy spain and and they complement uh, our relations with the eu because some of these decisions that we take at eu level ultimately have to be implemented at at the members for instance if we decide to uh, to work on investments and trade finally it is the member states uh, which will be uh, conducting the the investment or the trade so it's a, it's a very um, uh, dynamic uh, relationship uh, we work both with with uh, with the institution of eu uh, and and also uh, simultaneously with the member states so uh, when we talk to the member states we also talk about eu and when we talk to eu uh, we also discuss how the member states can cooperate so this uh, in all is what i wanted to say that uh, it is a very uh, enriching relationship it is it has holds lots of promise uh, it has uh, in in europe and in particularly in the, in the eu member states we have a large diaspora presence our calculation is that it's more than a million so if you include uh, the diaspora that is present in uh, in the uk so our diaspora in in europe should be touching somewhere bit, uh, to somewhere 3 million people um, you know slightly less than what we have in the, in the us so you know we never see that angle you know we always ignore that angle but 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 lots of indian people uh, you know are there in in europe they live there they they work there they making a living and the second point which i want to make here is this uh, the number of students you know earlier uh, we had students going only to to uk in large numbers but now we are seeing students going to to germany to france to to netherlands uh, to italy uh, spain uh, czech republic so again you know it's it's a big number of people who are going uh, for education um, to to europe uh, you know we are, we are we are seeing uh, the the plight of the students in in ukraine but uh, ukraine uh, we don't consider it europe in that way in in, in our de definition of 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 the of the continent but but it's just an example of uh, the number of students that go from india uh, to to uh, europe to study 
so they, they they build bridges they build connections and you know they are also they also generate business for for european companies and indian companies so i think this is what i wanted to say in in brief uh, the richness of a relationship the diversity of a relationship and there is much more that will come as india and eu uh, work together if the free trade agreements uh, get uh, uh, you know concluded in the next couple of years uh, then i think uh, 2020 four onwards you know it will it will really pick up the trajectory will will pick up much more and you will see much more of uh, india present in europe and uh, europe pr present in india so with this uh, mr janardhan I, I i end my remarks if there are any questions i would be happy to take uh, thank you uh, mr chakravarti that was a 360 degree view of various initiatives that have been going on and uh, we do hope that most of them will fructify in the years to come. And as he said, uh, is there time for a few questions, Sujit, that he wants to take? Uh, uh, yes, Casey. Uh, so, uh, so I have a question. Uh, this regards to the, regarding the FTA. Um, so we signed an FTA with UK, uh, uh, which was trying to figure out what sort of agreement or understanding we can get on low-hanging fruits, trying to get easier uh, agreements done first. Is there a possibility of discussing something on the on those lines with EU, trying to get the easier uh, agreements in place before we go for a much more comprehensive FTA discussions? Well, that's a very good question. My answer to that is that you know we had actually proposed this to the EU that why don't we have an early harvest agreement where you know the low hanging fruit could be pocketed by both sides and then we we move on to to a more comprehensive FTA. But the EU declined that. They said that you know under their uh, circumstances the early harvest uh, is not possible in fact they said that the regulatory and other approvals needed for the early harvest would be the same as that for a full full scale agreement so they preferred a full scale agreement but but to be very frank we had uh, discussed this and we had offered uh, this as, as a way forward uh, but because of their own compulsions because the eu also has to deal with uh, 27 member states and and uh, and uh, uh, that is that is a challenge it's it, it is not easy and uh, then we understood the point that they made, and and so we we decided to go for full fledged FTA with the EU. But but with the UK uh, leaving the EU, uh, things were uh, slightly simpler, and and they agreed to uh, to an early harvest agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chakravarti, for those lucid answers. And uh, we now invite Mr. Laurent Le Denoy, team leader. Cooperation section, delegation of European Union to India and Bhutan to take us through the EU Global Gateway, building links, not dependencies. Over to Mr. Lore Lee Denoy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and um, good afternoon, uh, Joint Secretary, uh, dear guests and participants. Um, before I start my presentation, I would be uh, remiss uh, not to recall the, the, the dark developments taking place as we speak, and I'm, I'm speaking here on behalf of my institution. Um, as you know, we are meeting at a strategic juncture in Europe's history, uh, where the unprovoked and unjustified uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine is putting into question the very foundation of the rules-based international order. Um, Russia's aggression against Ukraine that goes against everything that matters fundamentally to us. International law, yeah, yeah, international law, uh, respect for the UN Charter, the sovereignty of territorial integrity of a country, the freedom and the very life of its citizens and those living in Ukraine. Um, we have seen civilians being victims of shelling, also an Indian student uh, very recently. Uh, that's a very, a very unfortunate. Hundreds of civilians uh, are trying to flee the violence unleashed by Russia. This precedent uh, will erode uh, the international order. Any member of the international community could face similar threats against its, its integrity and sovereignty. And these basic principles underpinning the rules-based uh, world order are also the foundation stone of the EU Global Gateway Initiative, which I am going to, to present to you um, so I, I felt we, we, we had to, to share those well. So um, Arun, if you can put back the, yeah, the presentation, that would be appreciated. 
if not, I will just present it. But yeah, thank you very much. So <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. Right, no, so yeah, so yeah, so what is the a global gateway? Okay, it's a, it's a, a new strategy. It's a kind of response from the EU, uh, which is approved by um, the EU and the 27 member states uh, late uh, 2021. So it's quite recent. Um, I think you could see it as no surprise as, as Sandeep Chakraborty uh, mentioned about uh, the connectivity partnership, the Indo-Pacific strategy. So this is in line with that and taking the India partnership and the Asia partnership or Indo-Pacific strategy to um, I mean a global gateway or global connectivity uh, partnership. Um, basically, it's quite, I think it's, it's quite simple to say that, I mean, we've all seen actually how much we, we are interdependent with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And we're trying to look at how to you know, address that. Um, so the Global Gateway is a new European strategy to boost smart, clean and secure links in several sectors, namely digitalization, clean climate and energy, transport, health, education and research. Um, it's looking at a higher quality project based on needs of partner countries and here in India, obviously. And, and basically the Global Gateway tries to narrow the gap, the, the global investment gap. So we, we've seen that in terms of infrastructure and Sandeep Chakraborty has, has reminding the expectations in, in different fields of, of infrastructure. We hope that the Global Gateway can help uh, meet some of these infrastructure needs. And that's, that's our ambition and, and, our, and our hope. Um, in a sense, uh, you could say the Global Gateway is nothing really new, actually. We have the SDGs, we have the climate, uh, uh, we have the, the Paris Agreement on, on climate issues. So, so the Global Gateway is really very much within, within these global commitments. Um, what is a little bit new, maybe, is, is let's say, our internal, uh, not cuisine, but our internal teamwork and how, how collectively we should, we should work uh, better together uh, with uh, the EU as an institution, the member states, but also our financial and development institution, namely the European Investment Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but also the private banking sector. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So the global gateway, if you want, is, is really to support hard and soft infrastructure. Uh, the hard infrastructure that we've discussed, uh, Sandeep has discussed, I have highlighted that, but also the soft infrastructure because physical infrastructure is required, but you need all the capacities also, all the, all the skills, the soft skills to, to, to manage those, those uh, uh, infrastructure, if infrastructure are going to be new of a different nature, if they are, addressed, if they are to address the climate change uh, and the energy transition needs. Um, Global Gateway is also to provide an enabling environment uh, by offering attractive investment and business-friendly trading conditions. Um, it builds on, on common principles and, and, and some of it uh, echoes what's happening uh, in Ukraine of democratic values and high standards, uh, good governance and transparency, equal partnerships, green and clean uh, deal, uh, security issues. Um, so security very much with the digitalization uh, of things. How do you protect uh, uh, personal data, for instance? And, um, and, and new capitalization of private sector investment. So we, we bring in uh, public uh, uh, investment also to catalyze and, and, and facilitate private sector investment. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of global gateway governance or stakeholders, um, I mentioned the, the Team Europe initiatives, how we, we work uh, within all, 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 all the partners. And it's our role in the delegations to try to coordinate uh, the different members here in India. 
but you also have some civil society actors like think tanks, uh, NGOs, or whatever. I mean, academia. So, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of actors here. The private sector, obviously, and here we um, we intend to set up a business adv advisory group. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the importance of, of communicating on this global gateway, uh, creating, again, links, but not dependencies, working together to achieve uh, common goals and common challenges uh, for the planet and for people. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, in terms of budget, so um, we have to look at the figures and, and, and be cautious about the figures. So we, our ambitions is to mobilize 30 billion euros of investment through the next uh, seven years. Okay, so 300 billion euros, it's a mix of, let's say, public funds and private funds. So, and some of our public funds is there to try to, to mobilize some of the private funds. And I will mention that a little bit more in detail behind. And we have what we call the European Fund for Sustainable Development, which is one of our instruments, uh, which is an important role to leverage public and private investments in priority areas, including connectivity. Next slide, please. So briefly, what is this uh, European Fund for Sustainable Development? I mean, in a sense, you could say it's just uh, uh, funds to help achieve uh, sustainable uh, development goals, the famous SDGs, and, and it is actually. Uh, but, but briefly, and, and here there will be something new for, for Asia and for India, uh, two things you, you, many of you will know best or are more comfortable with is the blending facilities. It's a mix of, let's say, EU grants that the European Commission brings often and development banks' loans. So a mix of loans and banks, uh, loans and grants. Um, and like we do that in India very much, you will see later with a uh, Agence Française de Développement or KFW. Uh, so EFSD Plus is blending facilities, is blending money, and it's also technical assistance. So these are you probably more comfortable with, but it's also now, and that's going to be the game changer if that works, it's also budgetary guarantees. And basically when, when the private sector is shy and doesn't really want to invest in some sectors, uh, social uh, impact sectors in particular, then uh, we have systems where guarantees can help uh, de-risking, right? So, so that's a new. The, this, these guarantees have been uh, available in Africa, and now they they are starting. They are going to start being available in Asia and in India. Next, next uh, slide, please. Okay, I will go fast, but here, but basically, just for you to see that we have what we call, well, we have three kind of of windows for these guarantees. One is uh, targeting sovereign and, and non-commercial sub-sovereign uh, guarantees. One is targeting commercial sub-sovereign and all, the others are private sector. So different entities can apply for these guarantees. Uh, in term, yeah, just the one before, please. <laughs> yes, in terms of sources of, of financing, that's, no, next one, please. <laughs> Yeah, in terms of sources of financing for the Asia Pacific and for India, uh, basically, if we look at uh, globally, uh, let's say the the EU uh, already um, dedicated budget, uh, what we call the Global Europe. So that's that's money that is already earmarked for for globally for global Europe. So all our investment beyond Europe is 80 billion euro. So out of these 300 billion euros, we've got 80 billion from global Europe, which is already income, uh, tax income from, income tax, sorry, from, from the taxpayers' money. Okay, so from that, from these 80 billion for the whole world, they will, they will be 8.5 billion for the Asia Pacific. And within that, there will be 1 billion euros of guarantees, 300 billion of blending, and 90 million of grants for India. Right, so you can see that uh, we started with 300 billion, and here now we see in guarantees 100 billion, which is guaranteed. So we can, but we can still tap up to much, much more money. So um, that's a complex architecture, but that's also because we want to offer different uh, uh, possibilities of investment and support. Next slide, please. Um, 
Sandeep discussed about uh, different partnerships and modalities. So in terms of, of policy dialogue with India, so it's, this, this slide is very much focused on India. We have key partnerships in, in clean energy and climate, in water, in circular economy, in smart and sustainable urbanization, in connectivity, in science and technology. So that's, uh, let's say, high level policy dialogue. But we also have, let's say, what we call blending, these blending projects, where usually you see a lot of uh, AFD here, Agence Française de Développement, but also KF, uh, KFW. And we are trying to, with all these new instruments, we are trying to engage more uh, EU member state bank, could be Dutch, could be uh, um, uh, Italian, it could be uh, Sp Spaniards. We see so far that some of them have, don't have much experience in India, some others have more. Uh, but some are, some are new, so we are going to try to accompany them to bring in more resources to, to India. And, and in, in, the, in the last few years and coming years, we, we are through 47 million euros of EU grants. We are mobilizing, we help mobilize 575 or almost 580 million euros of loans. Next slide, please. Um, so with the, with the global gateway, we really try to reach the next level. We try to, to really have bigger impacts. So, so, uh, and it will take dialogue and work together and investment together and, and quality policy dialogue and quality pipeline work. The pipeline work is where we try to find new investments. So uh, potential flagships could be, I mean, we have EIB who's, doing, who's investing around 500 million euros per year in, in, in India, up to now focusing on, on, on transport and metro because they, they, they see a very, very good uh, uh, ministry of transport, really very used to, let's say, EIB uh, procedures and therefore really capacity actually to absorb uh, such large uh, uh, loans. Um, but obviously EIB in, intends to diversify its its support to 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 India and has been in discussion uh, with the government of India and will be here next week actually to to monitor these uh, metro projects but also to look at the other areas uh, where where EIB could invest. Um, we also have another uh, South Asia uh, regional program on accelerating climate smart and inclusive infrastructure in South Asia. Um, with a, a good share, I mean, the largest share of projects actually are India specific. And this is also, it's, it's a, let's say a smaller grant of 18 million, but we, we aim at um, leveraging uh, around eight or 800 million euros of private sector investment in the future in the region, including a large share in India. Um, we are also uh, going to support uh, CDRI. I, I don't need to present CDRI, I guess, to, to the audience here. Uh, those who don't know from outside, it's, this is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And in particular here, we are uh, interested in supporting the new infrastructure for uh, resilient island states. Um, um, so that that's we we are um, we have made a decision the EU and we've communicated that, uh, communicated that to the uh, government uh, authorities in India. We are going to support uh, uh, CDRI and the IRIS facility. And then there's other possibilities of really how do we uh, invest more in sustainable finance and how we do, uh, and here it's working with the Ministry of Finance, uh, SBI, RBI, Niti Aayog, the, the Indian private banks, and also EU member states financial institutions. So how do we collectively make sure that more green uh, finance uh, come into India? Next slide, please. I think it's the last, yeah, the last slide. So we have a lot of ongoing dialogues to try to really identify more resources for India. And then the, 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 the next thing for us is not just, you know, in just mobilize resources, but really make sure that those resources have an impact and how we collectively communicate on those impacts. Basically, if, if we only uh, bring in money, but there's no, no impact on the ground, that's not of much use actually. So, okay, thank you very much. I hope it was not too long and not too detailed for you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Denois. It was very interesting to go through your slides and the various initiatives that you have outlined. Uh, so Duke, I have one question. Could I ask him? Yeah, sure, Casey, please do. Yeah, yeah. it was very interesting to know about, uh, I want to know a little more about mobilize your city 
And uh, you're also talking about the EIB investments in urban transport and metro networks. You listed out a few cities and I belong to Bangalore. And I welcome you to Bangalore and I would like to uh, link up to see what best can be done for my city. Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, you, 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 you may know that uh, our ambassador was in, actually his first visit almost in two years was in Bangalore uh, recently. And if I am not mistaken, uh, Bangalore is on the list of uh, EIB metros. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it is. I'm just checking, but I think it is. And, and if that's the case, uh, I'm actually almost sure yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And actually EIB is going to be in Bangalore uh, in their visits. They are going to visit Bangalore, so very, very much. And we, I mean, we do actually invest, you you were mentioning about mobilize your cities. We have also cities one and two. We do invest uh, quite significantly in cities. And actually, if we if we talk about climate finance or, 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 or let's say climate change work, I mean, if we don't involve cities, I, I don't really know what we're talking about. <laughs> So, so that's that. That's very clear, uh, and we are quite clear about that as well. And if you see, actually, most of our blending, uh, if you look at the slides on blending, most of it is actually on cities. Huh? Uh, you have mobilized your city, cities one, cities two. Uh, it's it's eighty percent of our portfolio is targeting cities actually. Wonderful, because we are actually yeah. bursting out of our seams, and we do need a lot of, uh, uh, you yeah. know ideas yeah. and investment to cleanse our place and put it in order. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I now have the pleasure of inviting Ms. Arsa Pondelek. I hope I have pronounced your name correctly. Policy Advisor for International Trade, European Parliament, Renew Group, to walk us through the next steps in trade negotiations between India and European Union. Yes, thank you very much, uh, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. And thank you very much uh, to the organizers, uh, Europe India Center for Business uh, and Industry, uh, for inviting me. It's, it's a true pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, let me first also address best wishes uh, to India in fighting the COVID pandemic. Um, we saw that this pandemic, which is on a good track to, to, to go away, but not over yet, was yet another testimony uh, that we uh, all together are one world and one family. And uh, as a friend of India, I believe that EU and India should have a truly strategic relationship that we can reshape the post-pandemic world and promote uh, rules-based order. So uh, I believe and I always believe that we are supposed to be like-minded partners. Uh, however, uh, as it was already mentioned before, and it's simply impossible to mention uh, this issue uh, now today, uh, the world and the EU have noted that India has not taken a position against uh, Russian aggression that violates rule of law and territorial integrity and sovereignty. In the UN Security Council on Russian aggression in Ukraine, India abstained uh, together with China and United Arab Emirates uh, and was not able to condemn the war and bombardment of civilians that is happening just now at this very moment that we speak. With millions of people, namely women and children, although many women also decide to fight, forced to flee also to Europe. I understand that India is a founding member of the non-aligned movement because uh, I was born in Yugoslavia where non-aligned movement was actually created in, in 61. And Yugoslavia, together with India, was a founding member. And the principle of what we founded together at the time was actually exactly the opposite of what is happening now in Ukraine. It was building peace, defend the weak ones, the weak nations, uh, and all sorts of colonialism, and a big no to wars, and a big yes to peace. And now uh, what, what Vladimir Putin wants to revive in Ukraine is exactly a modern colonial, modern era Soviet empire. And uh, I believe uh, and, uh, that even non-allied sh should not just watch this quietly. Uh, well, 
let, let me then uh, continue, I mean, uh, with, with uh, our relations. Um, um, as was said before, uh, the EU-India leaders agreed uh, in May last year on, on a substantial trade package. Uh, and uh, there are, as has been mentioned, different tracks. One of them is a... a balanced, ambitious, comprehensive, and mutually beneficial trade agreement. Uh, this old terminology of free trade agreements has been a little bit uh, overpassed now in, in the European Parliament. So um, we, as it's also the WTO terminology and the terminology that we normally use uh, is that um, uh, the old approach when free trade agreements were only about cutting tariffs uh, is, now, uh, is now gone and the uh, uh, European Union uh, concludes ter trade agreements, not, not just to cut tariffs, but also to create rules, to create predictability and to create a level playing field. Uh, before these negotiations can start, the European Union uh, was, was clear and the partners agreed uh, that we would need to find quick solutions to long-standing market access issues. Uh, it was also agreed to launch negotiation on a standalone investment protection agreement because foreign direct investments with, with the Lisbon Treaty have also became the competence of, of the European Union and uh, also to start an agreement on geographical indications. Geographical indications could be like um, a fast track or low hanging route because in the negotiations that were paused, that chapter was almost agreed. Uh, it was really one of the closest uh, one. And uh, it was also agreed to enhance coordination between EU and India on global economic governance, notably in the, in the um, uh, World Trade Organization. And we know now we have new dates for the ministerial conference uh, of the WTO in Geneva, which will take place in June. And also the joint working groups were created on regulatory cooperation and resilient supply chain. Um, everyone is asking when will these negotiations finally start. Uh, both sides are working on, on resuming this initiative, implementing this initiative. Uh, however, it is still premature to give any indications of the timeline and implementation of this decision. It is a broad package, uh, also from the European Union side, uh, requires mobilization of significant resources. Uh, you, you know that we have several uh, bilateral trade negotiations uh, open at the moment. Uh, so it requires extensive preparatory work and consultation with EU member states and industry. Uh, in order uh, to speed up this procedure and to help and to do what it can possibly can, uh, European Parliament, um, as as big friend and an ally of India and uh, the, our co parliamentary cooperation ha has always been a cornerstone of EU-Indian relations and European Parliament always wanted to enhance this. And uh, therefore, European Parliament is sending a delegation to India in April of parliamentarians. It will be um, the Trade Committee and also Mr. Soaring Gate as chair of the EU-India delegation will also join this delegation. Uh, to discuss how to move things forward and also to explore the positions uh, in India and to see uh, if an ambitious and comprehensive trade agreement can be genuinely possible. Uh, at the moment, and this is also why the European Union said, let's first see uh, if we can resolve the ongoing trade barriers before we proceed to negotiations. Um, the, the traders and investors operating in India, the European ones, are, are telling us that there is very little progress achieved in this, in achieving to, to remove uh, uh, the current irritants uh, that, that exist on the markets. Um, we hear that they face quite a number of difficulties to access the Indian market or to invest in India. Uh, for example, extremely high tariffs, obstacles to accessing government procurement, 
such as local content requirements, uh, technical barriers to trade, notably domestic standards that uh, increasingly deviate from the internationally agreed ones. Because the problem is that India wants to uh, promote its own standards and, and take these standards as a basis. But European Union's approach is to, let's take internationally agreed standards because otherwise our companies would have to once adapt to Indian standards, then when they export to Mercosur, to, to their ones, when they export to China, to Chinese ones, when they export to Australia, to Australian ones, we prefer the internationally agreed ones. Um, there is also a lot of uncertainty uh, for EU investors, notably uh, as results of India's decision to unilaterally terminate all its bilateral investment treaties back in uh, 2016. Indian policies, uh, such as Make in India and Self-Rely on India, uh, aim to promote domestic manufacturing and discourage imports. But the problem we hear from the EU businesses is that first, to produce locally, they actually need to import intermediary products and inputs. And second, to fully integrate their Indian business into their global value chains. They need to align with international standards again. So that's why it's too early to say before several of these problems are resolved when, when the negotiations would, would actually uh, start. But I hope that the parliament delegation visit will also help to clarify that. Um, we know that negotiations were suspended back in 2013 due to a really important gap of ambitions on both sides. Uh, but the EU is truly interested in, in resuming uh, these negotiations, uh, absolutely, and provide meaningful access um, for goods, services, government procurement on both sides, and uh, a strong and binding chapter on trade and sustainable development. European Union is also it, uh, internally revising its approach to this trade and sustainable development chapters, which, which entail human rights, labor rights, and environmental clauses. Um, so um, uh, the ambition is also uh, rising in the European Union uh, regarding enforcement of, this, of these chapters. Uh, and to conclude, uh, Chairman, uh, open, rules-based and sustainable trade create prosperity and jobs. Uh, they deep, uh, it deepens friendship between people around the world. And uh, I really wish that the European Union and India uh, would have best of success in their endeavors to deepen their friendship and let their close cooperation between EU and India be guided by the Sanskrit principle Vasudhaiva uh, Kutumbakan, which means the world is one family. And these come from the Sanskrit text and Maha Ampanishad. One is a relative, the other stranger, say the small minded. The entire world is family. Live the magnanimous. Be detached, be magnanimous. Lift up your mind, enjoy. And India's approach is guided by 5S, which is Saman, respect, Samwad, dialogue, Sahyog, cooperation, Shanti, peace, and Samridi, prosperity. These shall always be the principles that guide us and also in the post-COVID uh, era together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Fondelec. That was a wonderful presentation. And I liked the way you said the Vasudai with the Kutumbakam and the important things that India follows. And I'm sure we will find ways and means to meet the global standards, agreed standards, to see that there is better relationship and it is going to be a better future for India and the European countries. Thank you very much for that. I now would like to announce that we are moving we can uh, allow for questions. We do have yes. all the uh, three main speakers online. So if we have questions, we can allow it for a uh, couple more questions. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, put what their opinions or would like to have any questions from the readers. So the floor is open now for questions. The 
Sujit, maybe you can mention who are the three leaders who are present and they can direct the questions to them. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, so we have all the three speakers. All the three speakers, yes. Yeah, yeah. We have Mr. Chakravarti, we have uh, Mr. Denoyes and uh, Ms. Pondelik. So you could direct your questions to any one of them and please be specific and short. I will probably uh, ask a question. Okay. I mean, I did ask this with um, regarding low hanging fruits, probably the easiest ones to get the uh, agreements in place. Um, so, do you have any specific uh, sectors or areas where you think that India and, uh, sorry, am I not clear? No. No? Your line is not very clear, but since the beginning, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it okay now or still the it's same? Best, yeah. yeah. Okay, so what I did mention is that I did uh, uh, speak to Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti regarding the low hanging fruits, the easier ones to get the trade deal going. Uh, so, of course, there seems to be a bit of a uh, disagreement on how exactly uh, this can be worked out. But uh, considering your discussion with EU businesses and with the MPs from the Renew Group, do you think any specific areas where India and you can initially work uh, before looking at the bigger picture? Uh, sorry, uh, to whom did you address the question? Because I didn't hear very well. Uh -huh. To whom? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, during Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti's talk, I did uh, speak to him regarding uh, before signing for a comprehensive FTA uh, between India and the EU. Uh, can they look at low hanging fruits? And there was a bit of a disagreement from the EU side on going with the low, hang, low hanging fruits. Uh, so, do you have any specific ideas on how best we can take the FTA discussion forward? So that uh, before we sign a bigger agreement in place, is there possibilities of signing smaller agreements? Or so did you understand or? Yeah, no, I understood. Yeah. I, I just didn't understood to whom was the question directed uh, to it's me. To you. Or to it's to you. Okay, it's to you, okay. Scarlett, because yeah. the line was not good. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, in principle, yes. I mean, th there could be some low hanging fruits of this package. Like for example, uh, you know, the, the fact that the package is now divided in, for example, uh, geographical indications, it's already one layer of this package, and that might be a, a low hanging fruit. Then also, you know, the investment, the investment route can also be like maybe one possibility because now it has been separated in a way from the trade agreement. Uh, for example, you know that also with, um, with, with China, the EU was trying to conclude a standalone investment agreement. But, but of course, I mean, th th this is a bit like just a theoretical, um, theoretical discussion because it's not clear if, if, if the member states in the, in the European Parliament would actually uh, accept that, you know, to, 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 to ratify at the end uh, the European Parliament only one of these aspects. Uh, uh, th that, of course, depends. Uh, also for the trade agreement, you know, uh, it's, it's, for the trade agreement itself, it's, it's impossible to divide it because we cannot just have like an agreement in market access for goods, but then we don't agree anything for services or for public procurement or uh, for, for example, trade and sustainable development chapter, we, we, the parliament would not be able to ratify just one chapter of this trade agreement. That, 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 is, uh, that is impossible. So in a way, uh, uh, as far as all this package is concerned, also investment, trade, uh, to, 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 to solve the current trade irritants and all this, uh, all this is actually in a way, a single undertaking. So nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Thank you very much. There is one question in the chat box. Could I read it out? Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah. Are there any specific post-pandemic trade barriers? If so, how have EU member states decided to resolve them? This is a question from Sonal Sinha, a participant. And the question is addressed to all the speakers. Anybody can take this question. Would you want me to repeat the question? Are there any specific post 
pandemic trade barriers? If so, how have EU member states decided to resolve them? Ursa, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't feel I'm, I'm too I'm very competent to, to answer that question well, not coming from the trade, but I, I, don't, I don't see any particular, I mean, unless you, you see any, but I don't see any post-COVID. I mean, I think the trade issues were before COVID. No, I, I don't know if there's anything new, but I'm not very sure. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh I also think that those those who were there before COVID have not disappeared with COVID, you know, like extremely high tariffs have not disappeared because of COVID. Uh, ob obstacles for European companies to access government procurement have not disappeared. Uh, so these local content requirements, technical barriers to trade, uh, Indian domestic standards, all, all this is still there. So... COVID has not solved anything, but I'm not aware myself either of, of, of the new of any new ones. But if there are new ones, it's also because of other reasons, maybe, not just because of COVID. So there are no specific barriers, that is clear. And there's another question from Aditi Mukun. And uh, I think it's addressed to you, Mr. Denoyce. Uh, he says, hi, Mr. Denoyce, thank you for your presentation. I'd like to know your thoughts on how the EU and India could jointly push for more gender mainstreaming in international trade and development partnerships. Given that, many countries in the EU have institutionalized gender equality principles in some of their trade agreements. Okay, um, I don't know, maybe Ursa could, I mean, I'm going to give an answer, but maybe Ursa could, could complement it because she's, she's more, I mean, I'm not a trade specialist, I'm a corporation specialist. So, uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, if we look at investments and not trade, uh, and if we go back to the presentation I made on blending and guarantees, uh, I can give you an interesting discussion we had recently with uh, the European Investment Bank and, and other actors. Um, it, it, and it was very much on gender mainstreaming. All right? So we, we, we were discussing with them how do you, it was about transport. Um, uh, if we were focusing on the transport sector and seeing how this sector, how gender mainstreaming is, how gender is mainstreamed through this transport. In loans, uh, given to India, for instance, right? So it, it is quite interesting because, uh, you, in fact, you see, my we internally push for this issue from the EU delegation, right? So we push from this. Uh, I, I, I was I was not so sure. Let's say how much, for instance, the EIB push, but in fact, they do push for the same, and they do have. Um, I mean, you would be surprised uh, by the quality of some of their um, staff who have a, a really high level understanding of what gender mainstreaming means in investment and uh, whether when you do metro constructions or whatever it is and, and other work. So the way I, I mean, to answer that question, I think, in fact, we do it already. Uh, we do mainstream gender uh, in investment, in trade uh, we actually discussed with trade, and if you heard uh, uh, Ursa, so, sorry, just one minute, Some, somebody's trying to call me. Um, if you heard Ursa saying we in trade, uh, sorry, this call distracted me. Um, but we do engage with uh, our Director General Trade, and trade has uh, EU policies, and we have uh, new directives which are, which are supposed to come due diligence uh, with uh, EU companies, and they have to respect certain issues, including uh, gender equality. So I think it's more and more like like Osa was talking about, you know, the, the trade and sustainable development chapter. Uh, sustainable development is is partly climate, but not just climate. It's also very much gender equality. Huh? So and 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 people's uh, development. So I think there are many avenues. There are many ways of doing it, and we are doing it. I think increasingly. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. As Laurent uh, already said, and s such a complete and clear answer was already given. And uh, ju just from my side, uh, uh, I think uh, India and EU also have a big opportunity here because recently the European Union has concluded uh, trade negotiations, uh, at least on technical level, with Chile. And this EU-Chile uh, modernized agreement will have also very, very ambitious chapter on trade and gender. So, so far with the, in the trade negotiations from before, uh, EU-India trade agreement didn't foresee this chapter on gender, but maybe it would really be a good idea when, when the Commission in India will relaunch trade negotiations to have a, a dedicated uh, chapter on gender, because now we are so proud of what was achieved with, with Chile, but maybe the, the agreement with India, uh, in the agreement in India, gender chapter could be even more ambitious and stronger. And, you know, there can be a lot in this chapter also, and to take into account diverse role of women in international trade, you know, also in India, many women-led SMEs, uh, then investment and access to finance for women, digital solution and skills development uh, can also be mentioned. So uh, the, the, this is an excellent uh, initiative. And also in the world trade organizations, there are some initiatives on gender where India and the European Union have really good cooperation. Thank you, Ms. Pondelik and Mr. Denoyce for the answers. I think uh, we are now going to be moving into our panel discussions. And uh, the first panel is on talent mobility in the India-EU corridor. I now have pleasure in inviting my colleague, our other vice chair, Mr. Arun Batula, to welcome and introduce the chairperson of this discussion, as well as the panelists. Over to Arun Batula. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And um, thanks to all the speakers and for the responses. So till now, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Nita Inamdar, Jean Monnet Chair, Professor and Head Manipal Center for European Studies, uh, Jean Monnet Center for Excellence, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, that is Mahe in Manipal. The panelists include Ms. Julianne Fromter, Program Lead EU India Inner Center, German Entrepreneurship, GmbH, uh, she is also very, very well known amongst the startup circles in Hyderabad. She worked here earlier. Uh, Ms. Sukanya Datta, investment advisor, AVEX, Belgium. Mr. No Nawazad Hudiwala, country coordinator for India, International Center for Migration Policy Development. Ms. Jana Kohla, founder, Halle Germany, Europe India 40. And all, the, all of these are our Europe India 40 leaders. Professor uh, Nita Inamdar also uh, brought in um, Mahe as a whole institution. Uh, we thank her for being uh, the support partner in, uh, in the EU India 60 campaign. Over to you, uh, Professor Nita Inamdar. Thank you, Arun. Uh, hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So good evening, uh, everyone, once again. Uh, and just as we begin with this uh, panel, I wish to know, Arun, uh, how much time, because we were to start at 5.15. So it's already 5.43. So uh, so how much time do we have for this panel? Based on that, we can decide how we go about this. Uh, you, you, yeah, you can. Uh, the scheduled time is 6.15, ma'am. Uh, but you can take a little more time. We have uh, very, very uh, eminent potential leaders here. So um, if the discussion continues, it would be uh, good to have uh, the discussion going on. My only request is that um, because each one of these uh, is uh, EU India 40 leader, let them make a small one minute uh, inter brief interaction about their current work because the profiles we have are of their you know, most recent work available to us. Let them start by introducing themselves for a, a couple of minutes and tell them what they're doing currently. And then we can initiate the discussion. But please go on till 6.15, 6.30 is also fine for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I welcome all the panelists uh, uh, on board now and uh, uh, open the discussions. And before we do that, I just uh, uh, wish to state uh, why it is so important for us to be discussing about uh, the talent mobility. 
uh, in the present context, uh, particularly uh, when a part of the world is suffering and uh, there's a war, uh, war ravaged uh, situations that are very, very disturbing to all of us. Uh, if that, uh, when all that is happening in the other part of the world, we are here discussing about talent mobility. So what it means to the world, why there's a need for talent mobility, how do we look at this entire phenomenon of talent mobility? Uh, uh, is it going to help us in some way uh, in working towards peace is what probably we need to uh, uh, think through in this entire panel. Uh, so maybe we need a context uh, in which we discuss this. We also need a framework and then of course, what can be achieved through this talent mobility? And I just want to do some introductory remarks. Maybe when you look at the context, maybe uh, Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti already provided us the context because there is EU strategy, Indo-Pacific strategy, there is EU global gateway, just as uh, uh, there was a presentation about it. And just, uh, and also we, of course, we need to discuss in the context of India, 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 uh, India EU connectivity partnership. So when these things provide a context, we also need to have a framework for discussion, which I think can be India, EU cooperation and dialogue on migration and mobility. So uh, I'm sure our panelists probably would take this, uh, uh, this framework and also the context in which the discussions can be taken forward. We know a lot can happen uh, when we just think of talent mobility, whether it is technology transfer, the knowledge transfer, capacity building, you know, the best practices sharing, peer-to-peer -peer sharing of expertise. Uh, all these things uh, are something looked forward to in uh, present the situation, particularly uh, where peace is a single most important factor that the entire humanity can aspire for. So, uh, um, so how talent mobility can actually contribute and particularly in the India, uh, India EU corridor. So we can begin our um, discussions on that. And we have panelists, some very interesting uh, panel members. Maybe I invite to begin with Ms. Julian Fomter. She's a program lead EU India uh, in a center, German uh, entrepreneurship team. P, uh, GMBH. Uh, she's also, all of them are Europe India 40 leaders. And uh, so maybe I invite Julian Hamter uh, to begin. Maybe you can, as uh, Arun said, you can introduce yourself in the beginning, uh, your kind of work you do, and maybe uh, present your ideas in 10 minutes uh, that you would like to speak about. And then we can take questions collectively at the end of our presentation. Hi. Um... Thank you, Nita. Um, thanks to the team for inviting me today. Uh, appreciate uh, being with you all today. Um, maybe um, to add to my introductions, um, I've been working on the EU-India corridor for about six years now. So just to give you a bit of context, I've lived in India for about three years between 2016 and 19. And ever since um, I came back to my home country, which is Germany, I've been supporting as well German um, entrepreneurs, as well as uh, entrepreneurs from all across the European Union to explore and enter the uh, Indian market. So my work is very much uh, focused around entrepreneurs uh, from either location um, to access the opposite um, geography uh, market understand how to do business, etc. Whereas my later work is mostly in the direction from the European Union towards um, India. So I just want to make sure that this context is familiar. I'll, I'll speak from that context. Um, so it is also very specific to entrepreneurship. Um, so obviously, we do see a lot of um, young people from, from both sides um, as part of the programs that I've been facilitating with, with the teams that I worked with. Um, and generally speaking, um, I would say the enthusiasm to, to look beyond the own uh, geography has always been a lot higher in India uh, versus the other direction. Uh, in Europe, we have to do a lot more advertising, understanding the opportunity of India 
etc. Um, for for people to come on board to understand the opportunity, make it very tangible to everyone. Like what can be achieved while doing business um, with with India. Um, our audience obviously is also a bit different, maybe to what we've heard from panelists before. Um, their resources are often constrained. So they work under certain limitations when it comes to resources, money, uh, bandwidth, et cetera. So that also needs to be navigated. Uh, and one thing that came to my mind earlier when there was the question, what are COVID related boundaries to trade is we couldn't really travel. And, and I think that was the biggest uh, barrier, especially with the culture that is so used to meeting in person. Uh, valuing personal relationships. So I, I definitely think that's been holding us back. And I hope um, that this quarter is also the final quarter of us being more contained and hopefully from Q2 onwards, we can we can change that again and, and travel more and have startups from both sides. Um, yeah, travel to each other, each other's geographies. I think the, the biggest barriers for general, for general mobility um, obviously is understanding and language. Um, I think that's particularly a challenge when you look from India into the European Union. We provide quite a diverse set of countries uh, with, with all different languages and cultures, etc. But this should not be... Um, this should not be um, underestimated in the opposite direction as well. Um, and that's something that we share with our entrepreneurs regularly, how diverse India is and how products and, and offerings have to be adjusted to, to different different uh, geography, uh, geographies within India, to different languages um, and audiences with, with cu different cultural expectations, et cetera. So that's, that's much of it. And speaking um, to um, to your positions about you know keeping peace, I think it, it has come up quite a bit in our discussions with our entrepreneurs, with our colleagues. How important this kind of work is uh, to keeping the exchange going, um, building stronger bonds, in uh, maintaining a peaceful um equilibrium for for everybody um involved and and move cultures closer to each other so we'll leave it with that for for the first round i hope we can come back to something yeah uh julia if you can tell us a little more about the kind of work you do at inner center what, what exactly is happening how do you connect yeah. with us if you're connecting and are there any major challenges that you see maybe and uh yeah. that i'll go to the next speaker yeah so the program that we're offering is uh, part of EO um, Horizon 2020 policy. So the whole program is funded by the European Commission for three years. And our mandate is to bring the research and innovation ecosystems closer together with a clear mandate uh, to support European entrepreneurs in their move towards India. But it still includes also matching with local entrepreneurs um, Indian corporates, uh, Indian um, experts, the investment um, ecosystem, etc. Um, the way we do that, and, and it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, that there's still an element of awareness building that we need to do within the European Commission of the opportunities that exist in India, even for like startups and scale-ups, not just for mid-size and large companies is making them tangible, like really providing insights into how does the mobility sector operate? Um, where are their uh, policies and, and dynamics and trends around EV, for example, like electric mobility um, that, that uh, entrepreneurs can, and can build uh, on top of other sectors that we are looking into, our healthcare, a lot of sustainability, climate, clean tech, agri, uh, we try to focus on innovation that is fundamentally different to what India already provides. So we try to add value rather than just compete on a me too level. There are certainly things that India can do better and we try to differentiate. We often come with a 
price disadvantage uh, or at least a price difference that need to be worked on, which is something that we do as part of our programs. Um, and we try to lower the barriers for these younger companies to um, enter the market and get them to understand what is required for them to succeed in this market, to take more informed decisions if to even enter and then if they decide to do so, how to go about it. Uh, the consortium has uh, six partners. A large amount of them or like the majority of them actually are operating from, from Europe. So you see how much emphasis there is on us educating the European market before startups even go because we want to make sure that those that decide to go have a good chance of success uh, because ultimately we want to create success stories so that we can show more startups that this is even possible. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe uh, are there any uh, business culture differences that are also addressed through workshops or trainings that are given because there could be uh, a, a considerable difference in work cultures across uh, and maybe uh, there's a need to uh, address that particular gap uh, in knowing each other much better because even before interacting with one another. Yeah, it's actually something that um, a lot of the participants have experienced even at some stage, even before they join our programs, um, dealing with people from the other country, from the other culture. Um, that they say like a certain communication has broken down or it didn't went forward and they didn't quite understand why that may have happened. So, and while we do offer certain insights into culture and, and, and how people are doing business, how sales is conducted, how to, how to negotiate, many of that remains a bit theoretical if you really don't get into it. So a very strong part of what we do is introducing startups to our existing networks that we um, already have, but that we keep on building out and, and expanding as well. And then be part of these conversation and actually try to interpret what happened. What happened in the room? What did somebody mean? Did they say yes, me, no, or maybe? Um, and kind of, you know, it, Con, like convey the sense of what is being said or not said um, um, to the European participants to find their way around it. Obviously, there is a different perception of time um, and uh, priorities, etc. And we try to explain and contextualize uh, a lot of that as well, so that they can, you know, come in with a little softer um, attitude towards the differences and, and uh, be more perceptive to what may be going on on the other side um, at the, the counterpart's life, uh, circumstance, etc. Okay, so thank you. And maybe I now invite um, Sukanya Datta, uh, Investment Advisor, AVEX Belgium. Uh, Sukanya, would you like to uh, maybe share about share a little bit about your own experiences, your expertise, and what exactly are you doing? This could be helpful to our participants, and maybe after that, also uh, present in a few, uh, maybe five to seven minutes, uh, your ideas on this. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Inamdar. Am I audible to everybody? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, the UCPI team, Mr. Nair, Mr. Murthy, and uh, the, all the dignitaries. And uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Inamdar, uh, to, uh, for uh, being the moderator for this panel. Uh, in uh, at the first thing, I would just like to say sorry and apologies that I'm very used to speaking with the mic and not very used to you know speaking on screen, but. You know, it's been a pleasure being a part of the panel and, uh, you know, I'll try my best that the dog doesn't bark uh, from behind. Well, uh, uh, I work for uh, the southern French speaking region of Belgium, as uh, most of you have known that Belgium has three regions like the states of India. It's Flanders, which speaks Flemish or Dutch the Brussels area, which is the key center and the capital, and the southern French speaking, the Francophone region, which is uh, Wallonia. So I work with the team Wallonia here in India, based in Delhi. We have our offices in Mumbai as well as Delhi, but uh, I'm the only person handling the 
inward investments that is helping indian companies and indian startups uh, to set up and uh, prosper in wallonia uh, in other terms uh, you can say it's kind of a hand holding facility that we do as uh, julian uh, rightly mentioned that uh, at times uh, there are possibilities that there is a lot of um, you know communication gap which is yes no or maybe and most of uh, the times indians fall prey to you know uh, private uh, people or private uh, conglomerates who uh, take you know advantage of them not knowing what's uh, how is it like how to put in money and how to maintain the taxes and other technicalities what we do here it's a government uh, agency it's a government association so we do it uh, free of uh, cost for the indian conglomerates as well as sri lanka bangladesh nepal so the fact is it is a hand holding thing and we uh, you can say also help in the talent mobilization of indians to europe to belgium for them not falling prey to any unprecedented things so for example us and, and i always feel for a talent mobility pool or a talent pool three most important pillars are number one the organizations both government and non government the students the education uh, related industry as well as the startups and if three these three important pillars are not interconnected and are not uh, flourishing in a specific region uh the talent mobility culture cannot grow from belgium to india yes uh, as we had a discussion a few moments back that it is easier for european companies european people to come more into india and after this huge uh, pandemic that we faced talent mobility has uh, you know entered a new scenario like that of a uh, circular economy or gig economy whatever you call it but things have changed and though there are no trade barriers as of now uh, including traveling as well as uh, well of course after this grave problem that we have been facing in europe after the russian ukrainian crisis there are uh, problems with the international uh, flights but the air bubbles are still on and people are traveling uh, to belgium for business purposes or emergencies so yes of course uh, there has been change changes and uh, what wallonia is doing we are trying our best to make people uh, you know cover distances and work for european companies work for belgian companies in wallonia because uh, uh, we help them in uh, accessing the funds accessing the soft landing uh, uh, incubators the seven science parks that we have we i uh, really believe that until and unless we work on these three pillars and especially the startups and the students and the phd fellows they are the main uh, key points they are the main key people who are going to create a wholesome and more of a you know innovative uh, environment for our country as well so as it is important for india to have a innovative environment it is same uh, we are also very much interested and we are also we look forward to it that we have a innovative environment and with the huge influx of digital uh, you know um, conglomerates with a huge influx of digital researches and r&d and uh, as eu uh, sees that we are open to 25 uh, by 2025 we are open to millions of jobs from and indians have a big opportunity in there and uh, being an indian working with the belgian embassy working with the belgian government you know i feel that it it is a huge opportunity for us because we not only bring in the belgian expertise into india we also bring the indian expertise into europe into belgium uh, in many cases we underestimate ourselves Uh, i mean uh, we think that we won't be bring uh, we won't be able to bring in too much of our uh, uh, efforts our uh, expertise but trust me uh, i have seen it in different sectors like biotech ict and engineering aeronautics agri food green tech 
Indians have a huge, huge opportunity and expertise when it comes to Belgian businesses and Belgian uh, entire uh, environment, the business environment. So I feel that uh, the Belgian government, the Walloon government is also taking it very seriously. We are about to relaunch the Wallonia tech program and uh, we are uh, you know, taking it very seriously. We are creating new programs, creating new value chains so that there is easier uh, you know, exchange, easier ex uh, exchange of expertise and technology between these two countries. And we really look forward to it. And uh, when it comes to the fellowship, we also have this Beware Fellowship 1 and 2, which uh, you know, uh, sponsors uh, PhD scholars in Belgium, which is again going to be launched in the very few next months. So uh, I would feel that talent mobility holds a big ground, both for the Belgian and the Walloon government, as well as the Indian diaspora. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Sukhan. So maybe would you like to uh, put across also some of the challenges uh, that are faced by uh, uh, by by people from both the sides uh, in this mobility, and what would they be? Um, but that then later we can find out how there are ways of uh, addressing those challenges. But at least to begin with, what are those challenges? You must be aware of them. Apart from what, apart from what has been posed by the pandemic in specific. Right, right. Right. Definitely, Dr. Nunamdar. Uh, actually, I would uh, explain this to you being uh, the third party person who looks at people who are facing the problems as well as I've lived four years in Finland. So uh, I can also add in what my personal uh, problems were. Well, uh, to be very frank, uh, the key problems that we face is not of the grants and uh, of the sponsorships. The key problems are more practical problems that people face. Number one is the culture. Uh, we actually try, uh, you know, we, uh, Indians, the problems that Indians face in uh, during talent mobility is number one, how to manage the money, the rent, as well as, uh, secondly, I would say, uh, the problems with the work permits and the residence uh, permits. So till 2018, the resident permit and the work permit were two different papers. By 2019, it was one single paper. So initially it is to take like six months, seven months to get the work permit done. Now it's two to three months. So it is very essential that we follow the exact procedures that is uh, mentioned in the embassy pages. Talk to people, talk to us, talk to the handholders, talk to the advisors and the government agencies so that they can help them out with the exact things needed, especially in businesses and startups. I have seen many startups, they just go there and they are clueless that how to begin. They have no idea about the incubators and the innovative clusters, the competitive clusters that are present in Wallonia. So uh, initial first one, two months, they just waste their not... Uh, knowing the exact facts and figures. And secondly, that uh, and thirdly, the thing is, uh, when it comes to the main management of the money and the work-life balance, for example, work-life balance scenario in Belgium is very much different as, that, uh, as compared to India. Recently, they have uh, uh, put forward the four-day week, uh, uh, you know, working style pattern whether eight hours a day will be transferred into 10 hours and you can continue it for five months. And if you don't like it, you can just get back to your five months. Uh, I mean, get back to your five days a week or continue with your four days. So these are certain things which people get confused about. And the traveling pattern, I mean, because of this COVID, it has changed even before. Uh, people need to understand that work permit and uh, dependent permit are two different things. So as soon as the problems of the normal paperwork, the documentary work is sorted, most of the other facts, the government is there to help uh, the people out. So there is not much problem when it comes to the other conglomeration or uh, the amalgamation of people in the society. For vice versa, the Europeans to India, the Belgians to India, it is the same. I mean, there is no much problem with the paperwork or the documents, but culturally, there is a bit of uh, I, uh, I, I, that 
something which uh, maybe Julian will be far better to tell me what she faced being here in India. But I feel that uh, it's it's a beautiful experience for uh, Europeans to India as well. Yes, thank you, Sukanya. Uh, maybe now I invite uh, Mr. Nazad uh, Hudiwala, Country Coordinator for India International Center for Migration Policy Development. So I'm sure uh, we can hear him and speak about uh, a little bit on, from the policy side. Are the policies in place for talent mobility or what more can be done uh, in this direction? Uh, I invite you, uh, Mr. Hodiwala, you can make a presentation and then uh, we can have the questions. Thank you very much and I hope you can hear me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this panel so far and to hear these very interesting concrete examples of how member states have been facilitating mobility between the EU-India corridor. Um, I had a presentation in mind, but given the time as well as the type of nature of the intervention so far, I think it might be best if I just say a few remarks. Uh, first and foremost, as ICMPD, we have had the pleasure of working with the government of India and the European Union for the past four and a half years on specifically this corridor and how policies can be uh, adapted, amended, shaped, <clears throat> and also well-informed so that we can facilitate stronger, more reason regular channels for mobility between the two sides. When you are talking about mobility between Europe and India, you have to understand that there are different types. We've touched upon investment, we've touched upon startups, but there are students, there is family reunification, there are employees. For example, Blue Card is a very strong means by which highly skilled Indians come to Europe and specifically to Germany. They are the number one recipients of the Blue Card, for example. Um, but there are other channels and other means by which Indians do come to Europe. And I think that's very important to just keep in mind. And all of these different channels require support at the policy level, at the government level. And that's where ICMPD has been working with the Ministry of External Affairs and other entities to be able to engage on this topic. When it as a first, first off, it's important to recognize that the corridor between EU and India is a win-win approach. It's not that uh, one side is dependent on the other. After all, the EU labor market, as we know, is failing in terms of fair fertility rates. It has a short, shrinking working age. There are skill gaps, such as what ZF Pop has recognized in several of its reports in the automotive industry, entrepreneurship, essential services, vocational work. But also after post-COVID, we've seen the role that migrant workers have played in Europe in such things such as trucking and uh, transportation and medical assistance. So all these are areas where we feel India has a strong role to play. We have a great amount of talent. As the global largest international migrant stock of 18 million, we have the largest demographic dividend. We have um, 245 million highly skilled workers by 2030. All of these individuals are typically orienting themselves to go to GCC countries. And if that a small fraction of that can be oriented towards Europe, I think it would be a win-win for both sides. I think if there's a second point I would like to make is that this isn't something new. This is a trend that has been going on for many generations and many decades, and frankly speaking, has seen an uptake quite substantially and quite quickly since the 1990s. To, to an extent now where, for example, in Europe, you have approximately 1 million diaspora of Indian origin. That's extremely important to recognize because that's a stock that is, as what the Ministry of External Affairs mentioned in its opening remarks, a bridge maker. These are bridge makers that face challenges when it comes to integration into the host community. And there, for example, what Sukhyana is doing or what Juliana is doing is instrumental. Juliana as well, I'm sure, because of the fact that she works with Indians who have come to Germany. And so there, I think these are really great examples, but we'd like to see more of them. We'd also like to make sure that they are getting the support they need at the policy level, at the state level, at the Bundesland level, also at the, at the regional level, but also at the local level. Um, because those are the types of initiatives that are going to make Europe more appealing and match those demands that the private sector is in search of. In, in addition, what we also find is that when it comes to existing uh, means of trans mobil labor mobility between the two sides, there needs to be a greater understanding of the, uh, the needs that Indian uh, citizens and NRIs have when coming to Europe. So some of the hand-holding services that Sukhyana mentioned are really good examples that I think other member states should be replicating. Um, this is highly appreciated when we did a study with European uh, startups who wish to enter into your India and vice versa, Indian startups that want to uh, in, enter into the European market. They also talked about a visa for startup, for example, that is existing in some member states, but not others. And they'd like to see a more unified approach to that. 
And additionally, for example, when you talk about um, the student mobility, you often find that students get trapped in this type of expectation that you need to have someone doing your handholding for you, or you need to have an agent. And not agents are equally treated, not all agents are equally qualified qualified to do the service that is necessary. So what you typically find is that situations where Indians find, uh, fall into irregular uh, situations or situations of vulnerability, and about 50,000 currently live within the European Union and are taking advantage of the different Erasmus programs that exist. You know, the plight of students have, of course, become really important in the last couple of days because we started to see, of course, you know, the 18,000 that are stuck in Ukraine and that needs to be evacuated. Um, but it also grows to show that there is a new destination emerging, especially within the Eastern European countries and at the frontier between Poland and Slovakia and Slovenia and um, also Romania, where Indian students are growing, becoming more and more interested in these areas of study, not just the traditional labor uh, student markets that you would have associated with the UK or Germany or France. And then I think the last part of where I would like to sort of share my opening remarks is related to maybe the, 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 the potential or the future. Uh, for example, when it comes to India, we have the national educational policy that was announced last year. The national education policy aims to make you know, India one of the hubs of study across the world. It wants to bring in all of the top 100 universities ranked uh, by the Times of, uh, you know, Times of London, Times of UK, I can't remember which one. And so what, how is that going to work for students? How are European students going to be able to know what are their needs, what are their, um, their challenges when they come to India to study? Additionally, when you talk about uh, foreign direct investment or when you talk about Skill India, you know, that's great, but then those skills need to be recognized in Europe. Because if you come to Europe and you're promised a great job or you're, you're, you have a talent pool like the European Commission is proposing to create, but then there is no skill, vocational skill qualifications recognition, these individuals fall at the, in the gap. And we see that in, for example, the migration systems in Canada and the United States where many taxi drivers today are doctors. <laughs> and just because of the fact that their skills haven't been recognized given the fact that they work or have ha achieved those skills um, back home. So I think that to me is where really we'd like to see going forward. But we'd also of course like to work with the government of India on trying to make sure that they have a more holistic approach to their protection of their migrants, especially when they're going to countries where they're not so familiar, um, such as the issues that emerge, such as uh, you know marriage and you know, individuals who have been remarried and marry again because of papers, or for instance, ensuring that whatever types of skills that are being developed in India through the India Skills Program or the Swadesh Program, all of these are then compatible with global standards. I think that's really key. Yeah, thank you, Anasad. I do agree that there's a considerable number of young, uh, students who are going towards Eastern Europe and uh, the numbers are steadily increasing. Of course, uh, there is also a, a return on investment that students take into account while they make these destination choices. And uh, we do see uh, the lesser uh, the expense, uh, higher is their chances of opting for a destination of that kind. Of course, there are so many other parameters, uh, but this is also one of the very important things, uh, the cost of education or the cost of living in this. And uh, that's the reason they are also making uh, choices towards Eastern Europe. So, um, but of course, uh, even otherwise, there is this asymmetry in the numbers. Uh, and that's what NEP also uh, uh, speaks about and uh, as a policy person how do you see is what NEP is saying enough or there's more to be done beyond just saying that we want to make Indian higher education a kind of a destination for higher education uh, where do you see the gap? Well I think if I'm not mistaken there's a lot of distance between the announced policy and the implementation and I think that's where the, the devil is in the details how is this going NEP framework going to roll out what is going to happen? How are these individual universities who wish to be establishing their um, campuses in India going to be allowed to establish their campuses? What kinds of programs, for example, at the moment, what we see is very short term study opportunities for Europeans coming to India. And what's typically popular is the alternative medicines, the alternative studies where you come for a yoga certificate, meditation certificate. That's often where India is um, high, far above the, um, the bar when it comes to European markets. Now, of course, India remains a 
pillar of education within the region, you know, from Thailand to Indonesia, those students are remain one of the priority destinations in India. So I think to answer your question for the NEP, it all depends on how it will roll out. And I think there, if I'm not mistaken, there hasn't really been much development in that regard. And I look forward to hearing from the ministry on all those relevant topics. But I think to a certain extent, as I mentioned earlier as well, you know, one other area where we need to look at, and I go back to your questions that you raised about challenges uh, post-COVID, is you know, many of these countries, including India, within the region, have faced large numbers of returns due to COVID. You know, six and a half million Indians returned back due to the Vande Bharat, on the Vande Bharat mission. What's going to happen to those six and a half million? We have the Swades program where they're able to register themselves and you know, perhaps make themselves available to the employers of India and the labor market. But the labor market in India itself and the, is slowing down. What opportunities do they, are they going to have? So they're looking to re-migrate. So, for the example, the government of India is looking to, for example, negotiate labor mobility agreements with countries like India and France that they signed in 2018, or India and Portugal, which were signed in 2021. And as, as ICMPD, we are, you know, at that level of policy, we want to make sure that these political declarations get the teeth they need to be implemented. And so I think that will be where the challenge comes, you know, in the next coming years is, okay, we have these great opportunities, we have these declarations, but, you know, how can we implement them? And I, I'd like to end with one point, which is we've not heard about is, you know, how has COVID affected mobility? Well, clearly through the vaccinations issue, because for example, only 12 European member states currently recognize the uh, vaccine of COVAX from India. Not all European member states recognize it. So when you are, for example, applying to get a visa to come to the European Union, if you apply and you, and you prove your vaccination, vaccination status to those 12 countries and it's recognized, that's one step. But I'm sure, as my colleagues uh, on this panel will agree, upon arriving into the country, you now need to have a, a vaccination proof, which is usually on a digital form on an app. And that app is not accessible to non-Europeans who don't possess a resident card. And on top of it, the most European member states now require booster shots to be able to qualify you to be able to uh, enter into a restaurant or a bar or a um, you know, um, theater. And so once those non-European nationals enter the European continent, that's only half the challenge. You know, what about the rest, which is being able to integrate and operate within a day-to-day -day society without having a booster? Because there is this inequality in vaccination rollouts. You know, many of the, within my family in India, but across the people I've talked to on the, on the continent, you know, many have not even received their second vaccine, let alone a booster. And a booster is only available to those of you in India who are at a, above a certain age, and or medical need. So that, Im that imbalance or that non-alignment is another topic that I think needs to be addressed when we talk about talent mobility. So, I mean, I could talk about this forever. I feel like there's so much to discuss and we've explored it in such great depth uh, over the last four and a half years with the government. Uh, but I, of course, don't want to take up the time of my colleagues and my fellow panelists. So if there's a chance, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the other things that I have on my presentation, but... Uh, I pass it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Nozat. Uh, now I invite uh, Jana Kollel, uh, Ms. Jana Kollel, she is a founder of uh, Hello Germany. Jana, maybe if you could uh, share with all of us a little bit about your work and uh, how do you see the talent mobility between India and you uh, in present times? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Inamda, um, for the introduction and also for hosting this discussion. Also, thank you very much to the Europe India Center for Business and Industry uh, for this great event. Um, I, I think I do share a lot of the perspectives of my um, fellow panelists. <laughs> I've already heard a lot of the points that I wanted to make. Um, uh, also, particularly um, a few things about the policies that Mr. Hodiwala just pointed out. Um, so fully agree to everything that was said. Um, maybe a bit about myself. Um, I've been active in the whole Indo-German environment um, for more than 10 years now. That's the first time I went to India as a student back then. Um, and since then, yeah, I've returned in different roles. I've also worked in India for a while, um, not as long as Juliana, just about a year. Um, um, but yeah, I had the chance to work for a German company um, in India um, I've been very active in the whole HR environment um, and IT. So I've worked as a consultant for several years 
And I also founded one of the first Indo-German alumni associations um, about 10 years ago because we wanted to foster exchange between students from India and Germany. <laughs> so um, I can still see a lot of the challenges that were discussed. Um, there has always been a very high interest on the Indian side to come to Germany, which is um, something that I find um, yeah, very intriguing, but I think we can still do a lot on the German side or the EU side to increase interest. Um, what I have been doing in the past few years is to um, try and increase talent mobility between um, India and Germany, particularly. Um, so I uh, launched um, this platform, Hello Germany, um, last year, and this platform is all about bringing talent to Germany. So we don't only work with talent from India, but also from a lot of other places on the globe. Um, but I think one of my fellow panelists already mentioned that Germany is um, the country in the European Union that issues most of the European blue cards. Um, so of course we do have a lot of talent coming in from India, which I think is great. Um, if we look at the future, I think more than 50% of companies in Germany are saying that they do expect a skill shortage or already have a skill shortage. Um, so I do see a higher potential um, to have more talent mobility. Um, of course, I have to say um, that right now with the whole situation in Ukraine, we don't really know what the market is going to look like in the future. So I think um, uh, we have to be aware of the fact that there may be changes um, due to um, yeah, the effects on the European Union. Also, a lot of people coming in from Ukraine now. So that's, I think, difficult to, to tell um, what the impact is going to be like. But um, generally speaking, um, yeah, I do, I do see a high potential. Um, I think if you look at statistics, um, there's an expectation that uh, on the job market here that we will need more than 260,000 skilled workers every year in the future. And we can definitely not cover that <laughs> um, on the German side. Um, it's already a big issue today. Um, and I think um, the, the students that were already mentioned here um, have uh, one of the highest potential in the talent mobility um, sector. So what I see right now is um, we work a lot with German universities to bring in their international students to the German job market because there are a lot of yeah, let's say operational gaps, communication gaps, and so on. And I think there's a very high potential there, which we are not really making use of at the moment due to yeah, policy hurdles, bureaucratic hurdles, knowledge gaps, and so on. So um, that's um, something we are trying to improve with Hello Germany. Um, so what we're aiming to do is to create a point of contact where people can find information about careers in Germany, they can get in touch with companies here and also um, get help with uh, the whole visa stuff, of course. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we do still, still have um, a lot of operational hurdles. Um, what I also see, I think we, we had a few questions about yeah, potential for the future. Um, I think um, Mr. Hodibala also already mentioned um, the um, challenges when it comes to recognition of degrees, for instance. So what I see right now is that we have, um, or we are already making use of the potential of highly skilled workers. So people from um, an IT background, engineers, software developers, and so on. Um, I think with regard to these kind of professions, um, I can see that German companies have already um, picked up on this and that there are more people coming in. So I'm, yeah, I'm quite happy about this de development despite the pandemic. So there has been a lot of mobility. Um, but what I do see is that we also have a very high need in vocational training professions. Um, so people who don't have an academic degree. And right now that's still a very big gap um, where we could probably uh, create better solutions in the future. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, a topic for the future. There are still a lot of things to solve. So as of now, I would say um, um, there is a great potential when it comes to highly skilled professions. And I'm very happy to see more and more mobility between India and Germany. Um, from a German perspective, I have to add that um, we are also competing more and more with our European neighbors. <laughs> so we, we, I think we are the top destination in the European Union at the moment. 
But I know that there are also more and more people headed towards France, for instance, because France is very active in the whole startup domain. There's a lot of investment going on, um, which also um, increases the need for talent here in Germany, because um, first of all, we are getting less talents from other uh, European countries. And then second, for incoming talents from non-EU countries, we are competing with our neighbors. Uh, so I think um, speaking from a German perspective, there's also a lot we can do um, to maintain our status as a top destination and to be able to compete with our neighboring countries when it comes to talent. Thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah. Just apart from all other skills that they might have, one skill uh, that they are expected to have when they're coming to Germany is the German language skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is where I see a lot of gap because I see otherwise a lot of students and youngsters who are already working who would like to make it to Germany and uh, uh, and to work uh, uh, in German companies, but uh, that comes with a major challenge. Do you also see it that way? And what can be done about that? Do you see because the kind of efforts may be just done by uh, Kyoto Institute in, here in India, uh, it doesn't meet uh, anywhere the needs of German language and culture training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the uh, topic of German language is one of the most important topics when it comes to job search in Germany for international applicants. Um, so what we are trying to do is to inform people as much as possible to try and encourage them to start learning German at an early stage. Um, of course, on the company and employer side, we can always say that it would be great if Germany becomes a bit more international, if there would be more options to um, also find jobs with less German uh, language skills, but I think we still have a long way to go. So um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we always have to differentiate between jobs in um, startups or in this whole software development um, environment, because with German startups and also for software developers, I can see a lot of opportunities for people who don't speak German, um, because the need is so high that I think in this environment, we're very international. Um, but when it comes to other professions, uh, for instance, engineering, where I see a very high potential for um, talents from India, um, yeah, it's definitely the case that people still need to learn German and have to have a certain level of German language skills, not only for work, but also to handle daily life um, and bureaucracy and so on. So um, I think what we can do right now is to inform people and encourage people um, to learn German. What I see on the employer side is that um, they have also become a bit more flexible. So, um, of course, it's still important to speak German, um, but I also know a lot of German employers who are willing to fund German language classes and help people with um, yeah, um, advancing their language skills. So it's often more about the motivation and um, showing people here that you're willing to learn German and less about speaking perfect German. So, yeah, but I think, yeah, there's still a long way to go. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Anna. So now I open the floor for questions. Uh, we have 30 participants here. Uh, it's time they can go ahead and ask uh, questions to the panelists. Uh, Professor Nandar, um, as we have uh, another panel to go, yep. uh, we can ask the panelists, uh, we can ask the questions to be typed in. And uh, if we can wrap in another five minutes uh, with your comments, um, uh, as, uh, Professor Nandar, then uh, the questions can come in and uh, we can take it after the next panel because uh, that is my uh, the panelists might be waiting. All right. All right. Okay. Then I think uh, uh, if there are no, if there's no time for questions, then I think uh, we'll have to close the panel here. Of course, there's some very interesting ideas coming together. So there's some things about um, a talent mobility uh, that were raised uh, in this panel, but a lot more questions remain answered. Is it who is benefiting from this talent mobility? Uh, is there the required knowledge transfer that's happening? Uh, are, are the individuals that are gaining, are, are, is, there, is the gain uh, more than that? Where is that happening? If there is a capacity building uh, that is uh, coming out as an outcome of this talent mobility. So are, is it bringing people closer from Europe and India? So it's all a part of the people to people connect, um, whether it has been, uh, strengthened through uh, all the initiatives 
uh, maybe we don't see it immediately when as individual efforts that you're putting all the panel members here putting in your small uh, individual efforts you might not see you might not see uh, the kind of implications that can have for relations between India and you, but maybe uh, when uh, uh, taken in summation, probably there would be quite some impact on relation between India and EU and in connecting people to people uh, from students to, uh, to startups to young, uh, uh, young people who are working in each other's region. And we only hope that things uh, are made easier, better, and fruitful for everybody involved in this entire exercise. So I thank each one of the panelists and uh, hand over the floor to Arun back. Thank you, EICVI for this. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Inamdar, Nawazad, Julian, Sukanya, and Yana. And we wish there could be more time and there will be more opportunities for each one of you to come on board uh, during the campaign. So please wait in uh, so that I can invite the next um, panel to the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now request um, Ms. Uh, Francois, Francois Binsfeld, Director Adel Enfance, the and uh, AEIN, that is um, Adel Enfance, the Lunda Du Nepal. See, this is what the uh, conversation earlier was. Uh, about the culture and uh, slight differences. Sorry for my uh, misspelling. Ms. Francois, um, the discussion she would be leading uh, would be on cooperation on climate and energy, India and EU. Uh, the panel panelists are Mr. Subramaniam Pulipaka, CEO National Solar Energy Federation of India, Ms. Raitam Macharla, Mocharla, VP, Tangoya Trade Team, Private Limited, and Mr. Flo Oberhofer, founder Terra Petra Impact Innovations LLP. Over to you, um, Ms. Francois Bunsfield. Yes, good afternoon. I'm uh, delighted to share uh, today the panel uh, on cooperation of climate change and on energy. And I'm also welcoming the three panelists. Um, who are also Europe India 40 leaders. So I'm the executive director of a Luxembourg based NGO, so Aide à de l'Inde et du Népal. And uh, actually, we can see that climate change is a major global issue of common concern to the international community. And we can witness the impacts of climate change already worldwide, including India. And so our NGO um, is implementing since 2019. Um, together with a local partner, a climate change project in the drop prone area of Anantapur district in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India, which is also funded by the International Climate and Energy Fund of uh, Luxembourg Ministry of Environment, Climate and Sustainable Development. And um, the objective of our innovative project is to transform traditional villages into climate smart villages by promoting affordable and replicable adaptation and mitigation practices. So we are covering actually five domains of intervention, climate smart agriculture, climate smart energy, climate smart water, reforestation activities, and also climate smart trainings, where we are training farmer producer organizations, women's health help groups, and also village climate risk management committees. And I think there is really a huge opportunity uh, to build partnerships in India and in the EU to combat uh, climate change. So I would like to give the floor to our first panelist, uh, Mr. Subramanyam Pulipak, who is the CEO of the National Solar Energy Federation of India. So can you please share your experience on um, climate energy and how you're contributing as the National Solar Energy Federation of India? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Binsfeld, and uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, uh, the organizers for having me here. Uh, we are meeting at a very interesting juncture today, uh, where uh, it would be an understatement to call it interesting. Uh, the entire uh, uh, energy spectrum of the world is now uh, uh, sort of displaced and the conventional thinking is no longer unconventional. When we look at the IPCC report that was released a couple of days back, uh, uh, unfortunately, it didn't get much uh, 
uh, visibility as it's supposed to. Uh, the writing on the wall is very clear. The best time to act was five years ago or 10 years ago. And the second best time to act is today. And uh, we have to do everything that's possible in our mind to ensure that uh, the climate change effects are mitigated. Uh, coming back to today's insightful discussion, uh, I was also mentioning this during um, the EU India 40 under 40 uh, ceremony also, that uh, this batch or this class of 2021 has many climate and energy leaders who have significantly contributed to India-Europe uh, relations in the energy and climate change sector. Uh, naturally, uh, it should come without uh, any surprise that India and Europe are uh, very close partners when it comes to climate change mitigation or renewable energy. As a CEO of uh, National Solar Energy Federation of India, uh, which is one of the largest uh, uh, associations for solar energy companies in the country, the fifth largest in the world, uh, we work very closely with our counterparts in Europe. Although different states in European Union have uh, different uh, country associations, we also work with the nodal association based out of Brussels, which is called Solar Power Europe. Uh, there are the cooperation between India and Europe uh, can be broadly classified into three sectors. And I'll just end with this and I'll open the floor maybe for other speakers also to tell and I can come back to it later in much detail. But the, the cooperation is uh, having three facets. The first one is the policy exchange, the knowledge exchange. Uh, where we are today is where you, some of the EU member states were five years back or 10 years back. And where they are today will be you know, in next two to three years. So the wisdom of European Union, uh, some of the member states goes a long way into addressing how the policy should be made, what are the provisions for enabling the energy ecosystem, climate change combating technologies, and uh, most importantly, innovative uh, instruments that can help uh, frame a cohesive policy to ensure that this ecosystem is vibrant and developed is something that uh, India and EU have been uh, cooperating for a long time. Uh, I'm very happy to be playing an important role here. Over the last three years, since I took over here as a CEO, we have produced six reports. Three of them are now a policy documents in the ministry. Uh, and two of them, the ministry has already acted. Like India is going to have its first uh, solar e-waste policy, which will be launched by the end of this year. And the initial report that prompted this policy was a joint report between India and EU that we, I co-authored back in 2021 March. So this is just a testament or one of the few examples or, or many examples of how vibrant our relations are. The second uh, instrument between India and EU, uh, which uh, uh, in the first inaugural session, uh, uh, this gentleman from our EU Commission in India has also mentioned, is the financing part. Uh, Indian renewable energy sector is 100% FDI sector. And today we have the second lowest tariff for solar energy in the world and the lowest tariff for peak power tariff in the world for the renewable energy. And I'm not exaggerating it, but this could not have been happened or this could, we can't imagine this without the support of our European counterparts. German Development Bank, uh, French Development Bank, UK Development Bank, uh, and German Development Agencies. Uh, and other cooperation, especially the EU mission in India, have and EIB, of course, we cannot forget European Investment Bank. They have contributed significantly for uh, you, this particular aspect in ensuring that the line of credits, accessible and affordable loans, most importantly, loans at a, of a higher volume with sovereign guarantee were available. Today, uh, $48 billion worth investments have come to India from solar energy in the last six years and it will double in the next two years. That is the kind of volume we are looking at in India. And it goes without saying, EU has played an important role. The third, last but not the least, and I think many of my fellow panelists will agree uh, with me, is the innovation exchange or the exchange of, uh, or rather the interaction of startup ecosystems, interaction of business to business uh, 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 agreements, uh, and bilateral solar trade or energy trade that's happening between EU and India. Uh, I don't want to break the news today in this uh, forum, but very soon we, we are going to launch an ambitious program of uh, 
bringing you and india together and making india as a hub for all climate friendly technology sourcing requirements of eu uh, we want to displace any other partner of eu and make india as the key hub and and when i'm talking about it uh, this is just not uh, you know an ambitious guy talking about it the data speaks the the, the figures on ground uh, talk more loudly than what i'm talking today apart from that in my panel today in the previous fact panel we have we have excellent uh, in the class of 2021 enablers uh, individuals who have played an important role in bringing the ecosystem of startups together connecting the industry together and exchanging the technologies together and i think that has really really helped the uh, indian ecosystem a lot uh, it, it, and i am not exaggerating here uh, in the first few years of our solar uh, journey we have just downloaded technology from germany we didn't even think what it is we just downloaded it and then we understood how it's going on and how it can be integrated or indianized in the indian context so i think these are the three uh, key areas where you india are, are cooperating and we are uh, very much part of it and uh, i can only see this expanding uh, because uh, uh, organizations like eicbi are uh, you know a uh, true catalyst in ensuring that uh, this message the the noise is created and more exchange can happen from both sides so with this i would like to hand it back to you and i'm looking forward to hear from other panelists thank you very much for interesting uh, insights of yeah the key um, instruments between india and uh, eu so i think we will come back with questions after uh, the other panelists have shared their experiences so i would like to give the floor to um, ms raita mochella who is vp of pangea trade team private limited so please uh, can you share your experiences on your work explain what you are doing exactly um, in terms of cooperation of climate and energy Thank you very much, and a very good evening and a very good afternoon, even on my behalf. Uh, as the chair said, my name is Raita Mochella, and I'm actually based out of Hyderabad in India. So here uh, I'm going to present a different perspective. I'm not in the policy side of things. I'm very much in the business side, in the grassroots level, so to say. So I have a perspective that is more to do with the supplier and the market and what kind of factors are there regarding energy, especially in our field, which is sewage treatment. Like the work we do here is actually ecological sewage treatment. So we are very much focused on saving energy in the solutions that we offer. And we are using the Swedish technology in order to achieve very eco-friendly and energy efficient sewage treatment solutions. So uh, I also want to say that our business at the moment is growing very, very fast because the market is definitely very interested in saving money, both in the capital expense as well as the operating expense, which means um, things that use less power and other consumables and operator based solutions. So this week has been especially busy. I had limited time to prepare, so I might not speak as long as I would have ideally liked to do. But I still have collected quite a few points regarding energy efficiency, which also, of course, contribute to the climate when we use less, less of power. So one thing I want to also mention is that the solution we are offering uh, based on that Swedish technology, it has been certified by the Indian Green Building Council like before we started any operations, we made sure that we had the certification, which means that it is truly something that helps the clients to save on their energy cost. And of course, it helps to recycle the water in the client sites. Oh, okay. So uh, one thing that I was thinking, like when I saw the title of this uh, session, oh, was that it's to do with climate and energy. But when you look at the market, like what we actually discuss with the clients, they talk mostly about money. They don't really talk about the climate. What matters to them is where they can save money. And if it helps the climate, that's an added bonus 
but I would say that maybe out of 200 clients or 100 clients, there's one person who is prepared to pay some premium price for something that helps the climate. Otherwise, it's always the cost first, and climate is, is a good, nice bonus if it happens. And uh, um, now one thing that I wanted to bring, bring out uh, in my opportunity as a panelist is that like when we are importing this technology, good energy saving certified uh, technology, what we have faced is that there is an import duty and uh, it is applied to us like in full because the product is made out of plastic. So we are paying the import duty for plastic products and uh, uh, that is not helpful in keeping the capital expense down for the client because clients are very, very cost conscious. I think that uh, there should be some sort of um, like different uh, exception exemption from import duties for products that are energy efficient or help to save energy. And uh, that would in turn make them more attractive for the larger consumer market. And uh, uh, I wanted to mention also that in our case specifically, we are able to save about 50 to 95% of the power consumption that would otherwise be there in like a conventional sewage treatment system. And uh, in, a few words about sewage treatment also in India. It is a huge, huge business. Like uh, you can imagine with Indian population and the growing cities, like there is an ever growing and absolutely um, humongous demand for sewage treatment. And at the same time, it is a field where the power consumption and energy is very important. And uh, every building, especially in urban India, is responsible for treating their own sewage. Like Unlike Europe, where uh, the sewage treatment is centralized and everything just goes in the municipal sewage networks, here each and every building, like office buildings, hospitals, schools, factories, apartment buildings, in the urban context, they have to have their own sewage treatment facility. And why this process of sewage needs so much energy is because we need to create oxygen. Like oxygen is responsible for treating the sewage. Like when, it, uh, when we supply oxygen into the sewage, the bacteria already that is there is able to do its work and consume the pollutants. So there are different machineries that do this work of supplying oxygen. Just as an example of the scale of um, cost and uh, power, uh, I, I'd say that maybe an office building that has about 1,000 employees might need about 2,500 to 3,000 kilowatt hours per month. Uh, Cost-wise, that's maybe 40,000 to 80,000 rupees, depending on the city sorry, 40 to 48,000 in the more expensive cities. And that would be about 500 euros per month for this thousand, uh, thousand people's office building. And then uh, there are also other aspects like climate aspects to the sewage treatment business. That is that uh, in the conventional methods or if we just store that uh, waste in a septic tank, there's going to be some generation of uh, gases, especially methane. Like if we have an anaerobic process of treating sewage, we're going to get methane out of there. But there are also alternatives where the methane generation is practically not there. And we can treat the sewage without any power at all. So I wanted to just say a few words um, on those kind of options. Like instead of having a mechanical treatment plant where you use a lot of pumps and aerators and other like power intensive equipment, there are very fascinating systems where you can actually do the same treatment just by using plants. Because uh, as I said, oxygen is the thing that we want to generate primarily. So uh, we want to supply oxygen to certain bacteria. So when we supply oxygen uh, through plants, it just means that we use the plant roots as 
the supply of oxygen. And then at the end, we achieve the exact same result of treatment without using any power. So these natural alternatives, I think this is something that uh, should be encouraged and there should be some subsidies for uh, this kind of um, alternative treatment because what happens is when you have like a, uh, it's called a reed bed or a natural constructed wetland. So when you have these systems, they require some sort of civil work, a little bit of groundworks. So uh, that tends to have quite a lot of cost involved. So the clients, uh, the builders and the building owners, they should be encouraged to install these kind of systems to, uh, for energy savings. And I think that there should be some initiatives or incentives where they will get, um, I don't know, some discounts on their uh, power rate or some discounts on other costs that they have to pay to the government or, or something. Something should be there to encourage them to uh, install this instead of the regular sewage treatment plants. I actually have a few pictures. I'll, show, I'll try to share my screen and show you like what is the difference between these um, mechanical sewage treatment plants and the natural plants that will be the ultimate good thing for our environment and for saving, saving energy. And also give one me, more thing. Yeah. Give me a moment so that I can make you co-host. Yeah. And share. Yeah. In the meantime. I'm trying to do that. A few more words about these uh, natural wetlands. It's also very interesting to see that uh, wetlands in general, they hold a lot of carbon. So if we start doing sewage treatment increasingly in systems like wetlands, it also means that we are um, we are doing carbon sequestration in the sewage treatment system. And that same system will remove your nutrients, it will remove the pathogens, pesticides, and it can even be used to mitigate floods. And uh, it, it is a natural habitat and you can use it as an out, or you can make it into an outdoor recreation area. So it's like a really, really beneficial thing. And uh, I think in the EU, there is a lot of expertise to do these kind of solutions. We have also been in touch with experts in the UK and in Ireland. And of course, I'm sure in other European countries, there are many experts as well, but uh, the cost is the thing that always comes in, in between to use the services of these experts for actual projects. We have experts in India as well, and we are currently cooperating with, with some of them. But there's a lot of scope for this kind of environmental engineering if the cost can be made affordable for the market. So, uh, okay, now I'll try to share my screen. Yes, please. Yeah, just a second. Where is it? There will be shared content. Yeah, just a second, I think I got it now. Yeah. Yeah. So are you able to see it? It is still loading. We should be able to see it in a moment, please. It looks like maybe my system hung or something. I don't know. I'll just try once again. Sure. And it looks like there's some, maybe it's a problem with my system. Or we can go and come back to you in a few minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, we will come back after the discussions and then we you can uh, reshare this yeah. in, a, in a few minutes. Sure, okay. Ms. Francois? Yes. Um, yeah, you mentioned that the clients are cost sensitive and that uh, reducing the impact on climate is like a bonus. So do you see any potential um, collaborations between other 
stakeholders in order to raise more awareness amongst the, the clients. What potential yeah, collaborations could be put in place so yeah. that um, customers or local people would be more aware about uh, the impact or contributing to reducing the impact on climate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I think that has to be done both for the public sector as well as the private sector. Because uh, like if these kind of, I mean, if the planners are aware of these kind of solutions, then uh, it'll make a huge difference. Even like uh, in Indian cities, if you think about it, like you can avoid all these problems that come about because of growing population and the sewage networks not being capable of handling what is coming in there. So if the city planners are able to make solutions or they demand solutions where like the sewage treatment is done in a decentralized fashion and in a natural fashion, like it'll make a difference for the entire like built environment and the entire like inhabitants of the cities. I also wanted to say that there are like in India, okay, there's not much space available in urban contexts, but there are also solutions that can be done vertically. So you don't always need a huge area to do this natural treatment, kind of a park a setup, but you can actually do it on the vertical walls of high-rise buildings. So that is where I think that uh, the EU and India could work together to create some kind of a forum where the city planners, I mean, the solution providers and the city planners come together, understand each other, and then integrate this kind of um, new and uh, environmentally friendly things uh, in the cities. And Thank you. So, yeah. You want to add something? Yeah, I just, I'll just try once again, if I can share the screen, because I really want to show that difference between the regular style of plants and the thing where we can save a lot you of can time. See now, yeah. Oh, no, you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. This doesn't really look very appealing, I think. This is the regular thing, a lot of machinery and uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the same job can be done by this. This particular example is from Maharashtra Police Academy. And uh, uh, they have a lot of water over there. At least I think they have some 50,000 liters per day. And this is where it is treated. They are using this area as, as a um, recreational place. They go there for their morning walks. And um, yeah, this is just one perspective from my area of work. And I'm sure that there are many other areas like in solar energy or like building, uh, cooling and uh, lighting, all different aspects where there would be similar, uh, nicer energy saving solutions that can be encouraged by the EU and India. Thank you very much. We are now coming to the last panelist. So I'm inviting Mr. Flo Oberhofer, founder of Terra Preta Impact Innovations LLP, to share his experience. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Pinsfeld. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to um, extend my heartiest congratulations to the uh, EICBI for conducting this event. And also, I'm very grateful for uh, you know, receiving this invitation to be on this panel today. Um, in the interest of time, you know, I think we're already a little late, so I'll try to uh, keep it very short or as short as possible. Um, so Terra Preta Impact Innovations, we are an India-based uh, company um, supporting EU MSMEs mostly in uh, what we call venture building. So basically what we do is we um, identify opportunities, uh, business opportunities in uh, mostly the social entrepreneurship sector. That means like uh, topics like regenerative agriculture, rural healthcare, uh, clean tech. And we help those MSMEs establish, conceptualize, build and implement um, businesses around these topics here in India. 
We also work a lot in, in entrepreneurship development in India. So we are, for example, heading uh, the state-run entrepreneurship development program of the uh, government of Mekalea. Uh, so we are in, you know, close, um, you know, collaboration with the government here. Um, I'm myself based out of India, so my my perspective uh, will be very uh, India-centric in the sense of what are the opportunities for European businesses, for Euro uh, European startups and SMEs um, in India around specifically around the topic of um, climate and um, yeah related topics as well. So. Um, you know, like uh, I'll, I'll just start randomly, frankly, um, one, one of the uh, main, um, you know, ways to collaborate is obviously, you know, um, infusing technology, infusing innovation from Europe into India. Um, and we are working very closely with the EU delegation in India on the topic of biodiversity, specifically biodiversity business. So uh, all kinds of businesses that are um, working on this specific sector and uh, biodiversity is a very broad topic and a broad um, framework as well. Um, there's a huge scope here in India. And uh, you'll find uh, not only the EU delegation, but also like the, the uh, state or the, the, the governments of different EU countries being very, very keen on, you know, uh, pushing this agenda forward. Um, considering India has four of the 30, around 30 biodiversity hotspots, um, you know, it's, it's a massive opportunity for European technology specifically to uh, help conserve and restore those as well. So we are talking along the lines of genetic resource capturing, like we're talking about seeds, um, restoration of water bodies, regenerative agriculture, um, soil health, uh, mycorrhiza, so there's, there's a massive opportunities for European um, companies to come in with their innovation into India. Um, at the same time, you know, obviously, uh, I think uh, Subramaniam G is uh, probably the, the better person, but, you know, I'll just want to comment on that as well. Uh, I'm based out of a small state in the northeast of India called Mekalea, uh, in, in a city called Shillong. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, solar electrification projects, uh, specifically in the villages here. Um, and, you know, we've heard a lot about today about, you know, pricing and, and you know, people are only looking for the lowest, lowest uh, bidders if you want it that way. But I think here, at least here, and I've seen that also in, in different places, uh, there's a little bit of mindset change. So I think now we're at a stage where people realize, okay, what we bought uh, four or five years ago on solar technology is just broken down. It was the cheapest, yes, but it's no longer working. So now here in the projects that we see, uh, you know, there's a, there's a mindset shift towards more quality as well, which I think if for, for European innovators um, is a good thing to hear as well, right? Because obviously the, the price point is always a, a huge, massive topic. So, um, you know, now these projects, even government projects, government funded projects are more opening up for innovation uh, and for longer durability. I'm not saying, you know, you know, we're going, they're going to buy the, the, the uh, best of the best and, you know, the, the, the high tech uh, products. But, you know, at least, you know, you'll see people are willing to spend more on um, quality products that will not leave them after three, four years uh, dead in the water, you know, just broken down. So um, along those lines also, um, I think for, for European uh, startups and MSMEs, it's very important to, um, you know, still keep this price point in mind. I, I'll give you one example. We have, uh, have been trying to get a technology into India, uh, which is um, focusing on manufacturing biochar, which is like a, a soil amendment uh, which you can manufacture from, for example, paddy straw, which is a huge problem in India uh, being burned um, and creating a lot of pollution. So with this biochar, you can use it as a soil amendment and, you know, it stores a lot of water. It's very porous. It's basically a, a kind of charcoal that is manufactured in a pyrolysis process under, um, you know, very, very low oxygen, um, in a very, very low oxygen environment. So, um, you know, it's a great soil amendment for farmers specifically working um, on, on high value crops like uh, grapes used for wine, uh, wine production. 
but in the end, you know, obviously you have the best of the best technologies in Europe. Um, but then uh, coming down to India, you have to have this willingness to adapt to India as well, you know, to somewhat also accept the concept of Chugar, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of tinkering has to be there, a little bit of, uh, um, you know, uh, frugal innovation as well. So this, this one project which we are doing in the end, uh, I'll try to just summarize it. Uh, the, the, the technology we had from Europe or we wanted to adapt from Europe, um, it would have had a payback time of 71 years. So, um, which obviously is, is absolutely crazy. Even considering local subsidies, it would go down to 50 years. And, and unfortunately, there was absolutely no willingness uh, from the European uh, company to make um, adjustments towards the technology. So the price will be brought down, which is a very sad thing because we had uh, projects or we had parties in India which were very interested in this technology. So, um, and like that, we, we've experienced many, many, um, many, um, you know, or, or many companies who had this kind of attitude. You were working in, in biogas and wanted to introduce the dry digestion uh, um, technology here in India, but the technology itself or just a few components for dry digestion would have costed as almost as much as uh, the, the whole um, biogas unit itself. So along those lines, there's a lot of challenges, but I think once we see that European companies, European innovators are willing to adapt to the Indian market, you know, this is where there's a lot of opportunities. Um, we obviously now see a lot of, uh, lot of uh, possibilities in the sector of plastics as well, compostable plastics with many of the states uh, banning single-use plastic bags, uh, some of you in plas uh, banning plastic bottles. So it's a great market opportunity. And the technologies are there in Europe, but I think many uh, innovators are just very shy uh, and, and apprehensive to get into the Indian market. And in, in general, um, whatever technology it is or whatever field it is, there's some program related, uh, related to that under the EU India Green Deal. So there's now, I mean, you have like GIZ working with Goa on formulating a circular economy uh, policy, which is you know about to uh, about uh, to being implemented. Uh, as I said, EU delegation is very keen on biodiversity business. So I think uh, if you have a technology in Europe that you feel okay might fit to India, like try to work with these programs. Also look into partnering with partnering with uh, local NGOs in India, which are there on the ground. And for startups specifically, um, I can only recommend to really. Um, also speak to local incubators because there's a lot of niche grants. Like, for example, if you work in rural healthcare, there's an incubator uh, which is giving grants for this kind of innovation in India as well. And that is even applicable for foreign innovators. So it's not only for Indian innovators. So, um, you know, I think with these few words, um, I, I just want to conclude. If you are innovative technology, if you have an innovative technology, um, India is a great place to be. It's a it's a great time now. Even you know, uh, even investors are getting more and more keen um, on you know investing in, in such projects, which you know has not been there in the past. So um, yeah, please have a look at India. Come to India. Thank you so much. I have a question to uh, Super Mariam Kulibaka. So in our project, actually, we are also. Um, Introducing climate smart energy like promotion of solar, LED street lights, solar pumps for irrigation, promotion of improved cooking stoves, solar dryers, and solar tamarind and mango processing units. So we also have a budget line for innovative uh, technology. But I always feel that we have not reached actually the saturation mode in all our villages. So are there any kind of uh, government programs in which we can tap in or uh, other collaborations which you can recommend for yeah, the solar um, sector. No, thank you very much, uh, Vince, for your question. And uh, it's a very, very interesting one, but more than interesting, it is the need of the hour. Today, when you look at solar energy, the virtue of solar energy is it can be consumed where it is produced unlike our large thermal plants or hydro plants. 
and the minimum the colossal loss of energy is also very minimal uh, our european counterparts have done a better job than us today and there is no shame in accepting that in india today last week we crossed 50 gigawatt of uh, solar installed capacity that is 50000 megawatt we are only the fifth country in the world uh, only uh, china us in germany and japan are ahead of us germany is fourth and we are fifth now in all the four countries who are above us 60 to 70% of the installed capacity comes from this distributed energy rooftop microgrids other uh, distributed applications and all in india it's other way around 80% comes from large gigawatt scale plants i don't know whether i have the photo or not in my other screen the photo is there you and nasa earth has just tweeted day for yesterday from the from one of their satellites uh, they clicked a very high resolution picture of the world's largest solar park which is spread in 45000 acres in india so that is a kind of uh, scale which we have achieved in solar and we have to credit where it is due but coming back to your question the spread is as important as growth we have achieved the growth but we are yet to achieve the spread today over the last 3 years we have aggressively worked with the ministry and just two days back the ministry of new and renewable energy has released a framework document which is specifically aimed at uh, promoting distributed renewable energy generation based livelihood opportunities in rural areas if you see the budget that uh, was presented this year in february by honorable finance minister she has emphasized on women empowerment nari shakti and of course we have gati shakti which is pm gari shakti has a long very ambitious infrastructure plan both these shaktis are actually giving more shakti to our renewable energy and the nari shakti part the women empowerment part will is very very i would say instrumental for any country's economic growth and india is not an exception and that economical upliftment or employment can only be done or can be done better with renewable energy sources like for example solar powered cold storage solar powered dryer solar powered bulk milk chilling machine uh, solar powered grinding machine all these things can generate a lot of value today you go to a farm in rajasthan where it is a hot bed for potatoes 1 kg of potato a farmer sells at i don't know 1 and 1/2 rupee or 2 rupees imagine if he can store it in a community cold storage which is powered by solar and use a solar dryer to dry it and then sell the chips 1 kg of chips he will get 50 times more value than what he is selling a 1 kg of potato this value is now accrued at the grassroots level at the farmer level not at the corporation level or at the at the level where people sit in a confinement of closed doors with uh, air condition at 16 degree centigrade so that is the kind of uh, value renewable energy can actually deliver on ground especially in rural areas we are going to launch a nationwide campaign again uh, i have to acknowledge the support of the german ministry bmwi now it's bmwk uh, they have funded us uh, from uh, december 2021 last year until next Three years, November twenty twenty four. We are going to launch a nationwide campaign, which is aimed at uh, ensuring we spread awareness for solar applications in agriculture, solar pumps, solar street lights, solar off grid system, solar home lighting systems. We are going to partner with our ministry. We are going to partner with our counterpart in Germany, and we are going to do it. And uh, awareness is the key. Once there is awareness, you need policy ecosystem. and i'm telling you we have very good policy today a stable government at the center a strong resolve and doesn't matter which government is in the state but everyone's common notion is to fight climate change i'm telling you india is very few countries where every party agrees that climate change is real and we have to do everything in our might to combat it it's not anywhere or everywhere you see it. the so called developed countries also there is a debate whether climate change is real or not but in india that's not the case and we are the only g20 country we are the only g20 country which is in line to achieve our climate targets so all of these things are not possible without a ecosystem that is enabling for uh, uh, you know grassroots level innovations but the point you have mentioned uh, i think it is high time we focus on that we can develop a million or 2 million or 3 million local rural entrepreneurs and the term rural will become obsolete once you power them with energy i have seen lot of villages in and around uh, delhi itself We have done wonders when renewable energy is integrated. 
Jharkhand, UP, there are a lot of microgrids coming up. In my home state, Telangana, in Andhra Pradesh, we are, we are trying to convince the government to give subsidies for solar power, cold storage, solar power, bulk milk chilling machines, which can help the local farmers set a community or have a non-bank, non-banking financing corporation to, you know, fund it and facilitate it. But uh, the schemes are there. Ministry is very, very positive. It's just that we need that last mile push and awareness to realize it on ground level. Thank you. There's one additional question. How far have the solar farms been successful in India? Uh, solar farms, there are two definitions of it. Which solar farm? There is a, if for us, a solar farm is an actual solar module farm, which I said 40,000 acres. Or there is solar on farm, agriculture farm, that is, which is the one they're talking about, if you tell me. It will be easy to answer. Although I have an answer to both of these questions. Uh, but if, the question is from me, Mr. Pulipaka. The business of having a solar farm of many acres to generate the power. Right, right, got it. So, uh, see, I mean, it's a conundrum here. If I talk good about it, it will become a controversy. If I talk bad about it, it will become a controversy. But I'll tell you what's happening today. Today, again, we have to credit you here. The large scale solar farms, the thing is uh, always, it has something to do with the scale, economies of scale. You are, there is no, you can't call it a solar farm if it is less than 500 megawatt or 350 megawatt. A 350 megawatt or 500 megawatt plant will at least cost you half a billion, uh, half a uh, 500 uh, million dollars. So that is the amount which we are talking about. And today in India, we have 1000 megawatt farms, 2500 megawatt, 2800. Very soon we'll see a 3500 megawatt form operational. So it's 3.5 billion in one place. So the business model was very simple. Government will come up with a tender, you subscribe to it, poor course the lowest tariff, wins it, and then you'll supply the LCD for 20, 25, 15 years, whatever it is. On the face of it, it's very good. And because of uh, effort, uh, affordable capital that was available, we were able to decrease the prices. In six years, from 8 rupees, we came to 1.99 rupees per unit. That's not possible anywhere. Or in eight years, we came from 17 rupees to 1.99 rupees. That's like we fell one tenth in a span of eight years or nine years. That's how the scale helped us. However, there are some integral problems that are only specific to India and some of them are specific to states, some southern states and some western states. Payment security, irregular payments, little bit of uncertainty in policy when the government changes, the sudden policy changes, then they renegotiate. These kind of things add sort of a risk to the investment that is there. After saying all of this, there is still a huge inflow of funds for utility scale in India, the solar farms in India. In the last two months, six new funds have invested almost $10 billion in India. These are new people. They, have, they didn't invest in solar so far in India. So they know that India is risky in this particular three, four aspects, but that risk is worth it because we have a stable government, coercive policy and reserve. So as a business model, I should say India solar farms, are a case study which all of us should study in Harvard and Oxford and all. But uh, on ground, if you ask me the reality, well, things could have gone better. Uh, we could have done a lot of things better. That's the reason why I don't get more than four hours of sleep every day. But uh, things are getting better, I should say, on that front. Thank you. Do we still have time for to take a few questions? Or uh, uh, yes, please. Um because we started a bit late and we have great um, uh, experts who are bringing in information from the ground. We don't get to uh, hear uh, these practical aspects. We can uh, continue, um, Ms. Francois, okay. till the questions. Are there any questions from uh, the participants? Now is the opportunity to <laughs> ask the questions to our experts. May, may I go with the question? Yes, please. Uh, my, my question is to Flo. So um, I was really, really excited to talk to him. And uh, Flo, uh, can you can you tell a little bit about the, the, the uh, organization that you are presenting? Is it related to Tata Innovation Fund? Uh, you know, Tata Social Ventures that you, you were working before? Uh, no, uh, first of all, thanks, thanks, Jagadish. It's good to see you as well. Uh, <laughs> long time. Um, 
So no, it's I mean like we uh, I, I'm the founder of this organization, so it's like a okay. you know uh, unrelated business to to any other organizations. In the end, we are a, a startup like many are there in the country right now, and you know we uh, try to work with uh, as many partners as possible. So as I said, we are um, you know we have this um, clients like EU delegation in India, like we have the the um, government of Mekale as a partner. Uh, but as I said, we also work with a couple of um, European MSMEs, um, you know, to get there. Um, specifically, social entrepreneurship activities started in India. I mean, there's a lot of interest from MSMEs and also from a couple of, of uh, MNCs like Lufthansa uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, work on the ground in India at the grassroots level, um, you know, where real impact can be made. So, you know, this is how we try to facilitate okay great flow so i'll catch I up with you the question. no it answers the question and uh, why it's interesting <clears throat> to know what you do is because now i work with the technical university of munich and and we are formulating a concept around one health so one health is planetary health like animal health plant health and um, uh, human health and most of them when we talk about one health it falls into social innovation and and we 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 deal a couple of uh, projects with africa zambia tanzania and uh, mozambique so i think uh, there's a lot to learn from you from the work what you do because more or less india and africa they share similar traits and the social innovation what you are promoting i think there's there's a bigger impact in africa as well so yeah i'll i'll catch up with you offline thank Great. you everyone thanks jagdish Any other question from the participants? Then I would like to thank the three uh, panelists for their very interesting sharing of experiences and I think that motivated all of us to look more into potential collaborations, uh, expanding collaborations, and also seeing how we can uh, collaborate more with uh, government funding as well, so that we are introducing more innovative uh, technologies uh, in India and through EU partnerships. So I will get back to... Uh... Arun. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Francois uh, uh, Binsfeld, and uh, sorry for uh, the mispronunciations, if there were any from on my part. Um, we are so happy uh, to uh, hear the practical inputs given by each one of our panelists and for the time you have brought in, um, Ms. Francois, uh, Premier CBI and our supporting partners, we thank each one of you. I would uh, now, uh, pass on uh, the stage to um, the MC, my co-vice chair, Janardhan, and our chairperson, Mr. Sujit Naya. Over to you, please, uh, Janardhan. Casey, Sujit. Hi, Arun. Um, uh, Hi, Sujit. Uh, yeah, I'm going to the word of thanks and close it. <laughs> sure. Um, before we give the word of thanks, uh, I did spot a few of other other uh, even the 40 leaders, if they are still uh, here and if they would like to add or give any comments, can we give them a couple of minutes? I did yeah. spot um, uh, or else uh, then uh, we can uh, go with the, um, any others, any, any final questions and comments? We, if uh, there are any uh, further questions, you can uh, send us email at hello at uh, eicbi.org and we will pass them on to uh, each one of uh, the uh, panelists and the keynote speakers. I will. Uh, I was really amazed uh, once again to see the kind of knowledge that comes in from our EU and the leaders. I thank each one of them all uh, for the time they have taken and for the practical insights they have given. And hopefully we will uh, uh, also be in a position to pass on through social media the suggestions uh, you each one of you have given. Um, we are working with a wonderful set of interns. Um, I'd like to thank especially um, 
of uh, Chinmay uh, Arundhati um, and uh, Tanishka and uh, amongst others. Uh, sorry if I've forgotten any names. And I would also like to thank uh, our um, speakers uh, for the day. Uh, Arun, one second. We have missed Mega. Uh -huh. Yeah, Meghna. Yeah, also uh, Meghna, who helped me uh, to, uh, apart from the other things, to uh, spell a few uh, French words today. And I would like to thank uh, the entire uh, Mahe team, um, MCES team, uh, the uh, Akramax team for their help in social media, WICCI, then uh, the Quill Group, EUI, EUDIA, Civilian Foundation for Developed India, EU India Association, and Symbiosis Center for uh, European Studies for uh, the uh, support uh, they have been giving to the campaign and especially for this particular event. I would like to thank my fellow Vice Chair, uh, Janardhan, for stepping in today and for being the um, um, MC. I'd uh, li I'd, uh, like to thank um, Mr. Soren uh, Gaye for once again taking time and coming on board and uh, presenting his point of view and addressing us. A special thanks goes to Mr. Um, Sandeep Chakravarti, IFS, Joint Secretary, Europe Best Division, Ministry of External Affairs India, for his time and for the time of his team and for the points uh, expressed today. And the again, once again, uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, Mr. Laurie um, Ladanoy, who um, had a great presentation. And we learned a lot from you, uh, Mr. Laurie. We look forward to uh, seeing you on the stage once again sometime in the future. And uh, also thanks to Ms. Um, Ursa Pondlek for coming back to our forum once again and expressing so directly and um, putting forward her uh, strong points of view. I would like to thank both the chairs uh, of Sanina and Ms. Fratos Pinsfeld. Thank you, uh, Sujit, for the opportunity. Over to you for the closure.